babies. Welcome back to another sappy episode of Beauty and the Bitch. I'm Morgan. And I'm Mick. Thinking of love stories that involve magic and adventure, they just get me really mushy, Mickey. By mushy, do you mean wet? (gasps) Well, that's just (laughs) so inappropriate for our listeners. I was just, I was curious. I, You were unclear, and I want us to be clear. I'm over here dreaming of magic candles, and you're talking about dildos. Potato, potato, bitch! Magic candles. <laughs> you mean a bubbling candle? A babbling candle. <laughs> a babble. I really like that. I thought it was cute. I thought that was really funny, too. I laughed super hard. Yeah, so this week we're talking all things Neil Gaiman's Stardust, mm-hmm. which was adapted into a movie, and we watched it, baby. Yeah. <laughs> You own it, don't you, Mark? I do, I own it. In college, it was one of my, like, go-to feel-good movies. Aww. And I have to say, after rewatching it, it's still good, but, like, doesn't hold the same sort of pool for me that it once did. I, I used mm. to have it on a pedestal with, like, Love Actually and, mm. I don't know, something else. Bridget the- Jones's Diary, that kind of you stuff. You like Bridget Jones's Diary? Oh, my Diary. God, I love Bridget Jones's okay. Diary. Well, no one's perfect, and you just be yourself. I love it. And do you know Bridget Jones's Diary was written, Mr. Darcy, the character, was written based on Jane Austen's Mr. Darcy as played by Colin Firth in the BBC's miniseries, and she said she would only make it into a movie if Colin Firth agreed to play Mr. Darcy, and he did. I care a lot about that. Whatever, Colin Firth is totes fuckable. (laughs) I I don't get it. No, it's not, he's not my James. Ugh, all about But I'm not trying to yuck your yums, I'm glad you like it. You're certainly not alone. Yeah, he's cute. Yeah. So anyways, what else is going on in life? Queen. Well, first of all, I have to tell you, I am so excited for this podcast because you know Neil Gaiman is like mm, one of my top three favorite authors, He's often my number one mm-hmm. favorite author of all time. Have you ever seen pictures of him when he was younger? No, actually. He's fuckable. I bet. He's a little. He looks a little bit like a creepy jander now. No offense, <laughs> Mr. Gaiman. But. I don't know. I think he is perfectly acceptable. He's looking. perfectly lovely looking, but yeah. like he was like legit hot back oh, in like 86, no, I'm gonna have to go Google that when we're done here. Mm-hmm. You're gonna wanna see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what's going on with me? I don't know. Well, so I've been writing for the last two days being a hermit mm-hmm. like I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've gotten a lot of stuff written. I've also eaten everything in my fridge. Yeah, I saw it in there. <laughs> it's real bleak. There's one Blue Apron meal left and it's a ramen meal that doesn't look very good. So what? Very but excited. I love ramen. I, like the idea of ramen Mm, i feel like it's so easy to fuck up there's so many like components in it it seems simple but it's not yeah and they're trying to get me to soft boil an egg (laughs) girl you know that shit's hard right like people talk about how soft boiling egg is like an art i'm gonna fuck that up well i'm gonna die of salmonella poisoning well we'll miss you (laughs) you're so look at you you are the (laughs) beauty (laughs) Um, but I'm really excited. Actually, you might even say that I'm happy that I'm going to Denver in yes, a couple days. Yeah, work trip. Uh huh. It is a work trip, so sadly I can't just like be high all the time and enjoy <laughs> legal weed. Only and, like, sporadically. Only very sporadically. Yeah. Yeah. I, what I was thinking I might do is just like maybe the last night I'm in town. You know, the next day is a travel day. Mm-hmm. I'll go out and like eat a bunch of edibles and yeah. probably get lost in the mountains and for sure once again we'll never die. see you again so babies thank you for joining for our <laughs> last episode <laughs> no but i'm happy too because um you're going on your work trip next week and then the very following week i'm going to california for a work trip Ooh. so we're taking two weeks off from recording which will give us lots of research time we have lots of things that we're planning and mm-hmm. frankly it's a lot of work to do the research so i'm kind of looking mm-hmm. forward to a little time to devote to that and and uh, get prepared for like future great episodes. Yeah, I'm super excited. I am. Um, I don't know. I've been finding that like the research is stuff that I care about and want to spend my yeah, time doing. Yeah, it's fun to like learn, but it is intensive. Well, I'm also very aware that like oh, people who are listening are sometimes going to be like Uber nerds and Uber fans, and you know how an Uber fan is, girl. They're gonna come for you for that shit you said about Lord of the Rings, but that's okay. Me. What shit? I, I don't remember. About Lord I remember you said something and the fans were not going to be happy. Well. Or maybe it was Game of Thrones. 
It may it may well have been Game of Thrones. Yeah, they're probably going to come. Well, and also I was like, when we were doing the Game of Thrones episode, and we couldn't remember how to pronounce some of the people's names, <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh god, these people are going it's to bring us to But you know what? I was thinking about that, and we've had this conversation before, especially when you read something before you hear like other people pronounce it. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, I'm sure we all had our own pronunciation of Hermione I knew you before were we like yeah. heard anyone say that word. Hermonini. Mine was Hermione. No, my was Hermione. Oh, totally. That's Mine what I said in my head. Hermione. I think I was like Hermione. And I thought something. it was a horrible name. <laughs> <laughs> and not that like Hermione is a great name, but like no, he, it's, it's, a choice. it's much more fluid than Hermione, which is a terrible <laughs> choice. But you know, whatever. We all learn from our mistakes. Exactly. And just because we're uber fans doesn't mean we're always right and know everything. Well, it doesn't mean you're always right or know everything. I'm pretty brilliant. I actually, in fact, am 100% right 100% of the time. Yes. Okay. Well, I read it well. about it in a book. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> it was my diary. <laughs> Everything that's written is real and factual, um, and Donald Trump approves this message. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> this message, but burn all books <laughs> by, by and Nazis, kill all art. Donald yes. Trump, no problem. Um, but do you want to know what I'm sad about? Because yes. I am a little bit sad this week too. Um, I'm not. It, I, to be honest, it's less of like, oh, I'm heartbroken, and more I'm irritated because I'm going to a state that has legalized recreational marijuana, as are you, in mm-hmm. about a week. And I was thinking about what a boon that would be for Arkansas if Arkansas would just legalize pot. Because it is such a poor state, right? Education in Arkansas is... Could use a boost. Let's put it that way. Yes. (laughs) And I feel like if we would just legalize this thing that not everyone does, but everyone knows someone who does it, Mm -hmm. right? All of that money could flow back in. Do, do you happen to remember, I know this is like pop quiz time, but do you remember how many millions or billions of dollars went into the Colorado public school system? No, but I think it was legit like billions. Like 11 billion or yeah. something? Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of good just insane. videos circling around of like, Colorado's so rich, they don't know what to do with all their money, so they're like investing it in schools and children and all this great stuff, and yeah. it's really been amazing for them. And I feel like Arkansas has had a couple times on the bill things about marijuana. Mm-hmm. So they're like teetering on it. And you know what else is really cool? I saw this thing about Colorado. It, I think it was $11 billion, And it was like, that's $11 billion that didn't go to the drug cartels. Yep. So like the the good things on top of what you could do with the extra revenue, just cleaning the streets up. Because yeah. no, girl, I would not go out of my way to find a drug dealer and go through a friend of a friend of a friend right. to buy weed if all I had to do was go to the quickie picky and get myself get it in a, a joint. Get a white baggie. Yeah. It's so cute. And they'll put it in a little paper. dupe tube for me and oh I'll just take goodness. it Oh my goodness. They'll be so nice at the counter. Oh. And to be honest, I'm so sick of making the argument for narrow-minded people who think that weed is a drug of like... How many alcoholics do you know? How many how, right. how many people get drunk and drive and kill? Maybe even someone you've known. Mm-hmm. You know, definitely people you hear about on television. How many high people do you know get in a car and drive so crazy because they're high? Girl, they're sitting on their couch, Netflix and chilling. Right. They do not want to move. That's the whole point. They're right? they're supporting the fast food industry. I was going to say Domino's. <laughs> Domino's should be lobbying to get pot. Oh, for sure. That's actually legalized a really right. good point. Because girl... Anytime. I'm ordering Domino's, girl. (laughs) It's like all you can manage. (laughs) They got that two for $5.99 each deal. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, girl. Medium one toppings. Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) Also, Amazon Prime should lobby because uh, when you mindlessly shop, sometimes you accidentally hit like purchase and then you don't feel regret because you're just so high. It doesn't matter. I have a hammered copper bracelet (laughs) two weeks ago. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> very much. Yeah. It's actually beautiful. I'll show it to you mm-hmm. after we finish recording. But it was very much that kind of purchase where yeah. I was like, this is pretty. I want this thing. And yeah. then two days later, it it arrived. <laughs> so you know what I'm happy and sad about more? You, what's going on with you? What, why are you happy? Okay. So we were just talking about this actually before we started recording. Mm-hmm. But a thing that I'm happy about that's super on brand for this episode is that there are seven new planets that astronomers have discovered orbiting the red dwarf star Trappist-1. And that's really fucking cool. Yeah. And they're all 
in the temperate zones, which is science speak for, like, life could be living there. And it's only, like, a billion years away for us to, like, travel there with our current methods. But I super believe in us. And I think that it's really neat that that's a thing. And maybe possibly one day it could be super billionaire space expedition thing that we could do. Yeah, so when we absolutely destroy the Earth and there's nothing left to suck from underneath her skin, we can just go to one of these other seven planets. Well, yeah, they'll just put us in our little bubbles and we'll just go to sleep for 70,000 years. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll wake up and we'll be like, God, I slept too hard. I don't feel right. Yeah. But you know, you know what makes me sad, though? Oh, what? Is that... So there are these planets and there's all these movies about, like, space travel for either fun or for moving to, like, a different planet. You know, there's all these sci-fi things. Mm. But what makes me sad is that we don't even realistically live in a world where we can believe in that kind of thing, even if it were possible. Because we barely live in a world where we tell ourselves and our children and our friends and everyone that traveling internationally is even a possibility. Mm. You know, I definitely grew up in a world where traveling was not a thing that I ever thought that I would do. I would just had accepted my place for sure and was never had aspirations to do that because I was just like, I'll never be able to afford it. It's not an option. And that's just really fucking sad because we need to travel more because there's so much in this world to see and we need to raise our children to know that definitely they could do it. And I'm a firm believer that... You Okay, you have money, you put in your bank account, and you're saving it, and, like, oops, you get in a car crash tomorrow, and you die. No, girl, you spend that money, Mm -hmm. and you do something worth fucking while, and if Mm -hmm. all you ever wanted to do in your life was go to North Korea, that's really weird, (laughs) but I'm gonna support you, because that is your right to go check out that weird fucking Soviet town that everyone's starving to death in, and they don't get the internet, but hey, if that's what your idea is, yes, girl, I would recommend maybe Bali. Instead. <laughs> My dream is to shave you bald. Oh, girl. You know, I'm only fulfilling dreams of travel. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, I can't get on board I'm with sorry. that. You know what I mean, though? I totally... You know, I've... I, you know what? I've never really thought about that. But we grew up in the same community, as I'm sure people remember. And that's very much the case for, like... The older generation of my family. There are some exceptions. My aunt travels a bit. But internationally, hardly at all. I'm on board with just... There's so much in the United States to see. I haven't even been to the Grand Canyon. I mean, there's a a million things I want to see. But the the point is, is that I want to feel empowered about it. And I do. Mm. And I don't like when other people question, oh, you're spending your money on that thing when instead you could have, like, what? Like, a new car? Like, I don't give a shit about a new car. Better give life a, insurance? I No, I don't give a shit about better <laughs> life insurance. I really don't. Like, I will spend and have, like, all the money that is in my savings account to, like, go somewhere fun. And I think that yeah. that has made my life a higher quality. And I just want to inspire others to, like, do the same and, like, definitely save some money to do it. Don't... Like, take out a credit card maybe and do it, because I've been there. But, like, uh, find the balance between your credit card and, like, that savings (laughs) account. The point is, we can do anything that we fucking want to do, and that's exactly Mm -hmm. what we should be doing with our time, because we don't know how much we have. That's true. And pretty soon we'll all be in a bubble on our way to the Trappist One (laughs) solar system. (laughs) So see the Earth while you can. (laughs) You know, another silver lining is, if people are in Texas and they're listening to us, the further they travel from Texas, the further they are from you. Yeah, that so, is an incentive. That's a plus. And I would be offended about that, except that Texas is, uh, I don't, I can't, I feel like, actually, I feel like the walls will cave in if I say something <laughs> bad about it. But <laughs> Did you see how scared I got <laughs> for this? Let it just be said, there's better places to visit than Texas, unless you're going to go to Big Bend, which we're big fans oh, of. Oh, Big Bend is gorgeous. West Texas Terlingua. has some gyms. Yeah, mm-hmm. girl, gotta go eat that chili. Yes, queen, and get that uh, margarita that's real spicy. Oh, girl, get two or three. <laughs> I always do it. I always get so drunk. Stay mm. long enough for a nice thunderstorm to roll mm-hmm. up. We recommend it. Seal of approval. <laughs> So, Morgie, you um, have pulled together some information about Stardust this week, right? I have. So, as you know, we obviously like Stardust because we're big Neil Gaiman fans. Mm -hmm. And I just 
I, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but the category that Stardust exists within is called romantic fantasy adventure. This is my genre. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is my everything. This is like like Princess Bride would yes, be also exactly. And actually, princess. it gets often compared to Princess Bride. It's mm-hmm. kind of that sort of story. Th- that is, if if I got locked away in a room forever, which would be really sad, but I could only pick one genre book, I would probably pick that genre. Really? Because I really love romance, but you know, I'm a big fantasy fan, so I need like a little magic in my life. But like. Uh, it just is the perfect kind of romance that keeps you going because it's not super sappy, but mm. like it does end really sweetly. Mm-hmm. And there's so much adventure. Adventure is like so important, right? Mm. It just like oh, yeah. takes you on a fantasy journey when you're not doing one yourself. So mm. that is my genre. So on Rotten Tomatoes, the movie Stardust has a 76%, which I'm not super surprised about, actually. No, I, th- I think, I mean, I like the movie. It's a lot, definitely a but C I think plus it's movie. Fair. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it's fair. IMDb, pretty on par, 7.7 out of 10, Uh and on Amazon, 4.4 out of 5. So Amazon viewers Mm. like it slightly more than other viewers. Maybe because it's on Prime and they're so pleased. (laughs) They're so, yeah, it's free. I can watch this? (laughs) And then for the book, on Goodreads, it has a 4.1 out of 5, which I think is also good. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think that's a great rating. You can't, I mean, there's always going to be detractors, so all in all. Do you happen to know, is that... The the Goodreads rating, is that for the words only edition or for the illustrated novel edition? Which is how it first came out. I think it's words only. The words only. Yeah. Because I think that makes a huge difference. Illustrated. I haven't even seen it. Oh, it's gorgeous. Damn, I don't have to buy that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll check that out. So the book was released on February 1st, 1999, which feels like a million years ago. Yeah, that makes me feel very old. And the movie came out on August 10th, 2007. So uh, not too much time, actually, between the book creation and the movie coming out. And I read that they actually had a lot of struggles with the rights to the movie. Neil Gaiman originally sold the rights pretty quickly, like maybe even in the year 2000. And so it spent seven years being tossed around and being resold and... You know, Mm -hmm. just a bunch of different changes before it actually got made and Mm -hmm. released. The film came out to pretty positive reviews. People generally liked it. It grossed $135.6 million on a $70 million budget. So, I mean, it effectively doubled what it, you know, cost to make. So, that's pretty good. It was also filmed, did you think everything was beautiful? I had to look up and see where it was filmed. It was gorgeous. It was, yeah. It was primarily filmed in the Scottish Highlands and in the Isle of Skye, which is an island off of Scotland, Mm -hmm. and in Iceland, and then all the studio shots were in London. So, uh, Scotland and Iceland are all on, they're both on my list of places I have to go as soon as possible. So, this just reaffirms travel, because I need to go to there. I just want to, like, island hop through that whole little, like, that, like, 2,000 miles up there. I just want to hop between islands. That'd be the life. That'd be Mm -hmm. nice. Someday. Yeah. So, those are just some facts and figures for you. Would you like to go ahead and dive deep into the plot walkthrough? Mm, I would love to do that. How do we start? Where do we go? Uh, What happens? Where do we go? How do we start? We hear the voice of a kind man bringing us into the world. Do you know who that kind man is? He sounded really familiar. He he made my uh, dick tingle. Did he make you reach for your hobbit sweet? He (laughs) did. <laughs> yes, he did. The narrator is played by Ian McKellen, mm. which I didn't remember at all until my rewatch. And me um I actually when I pulled it up on Amazon Prime, because after you told me it was streaming, I just put away my DVD because I was like effort. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, no, thank you. But on on the I on the thing that you pull up on Amazon, it tells you who stars in the movie. It said mm. starring Ian McKellen. And I was like, they done fucked up this thing. They right. put the wrong information on here. <laughs> whatever, we'll just watch it. Which, it's not starring Ian McKellen, no. but whatever. He but, talks uh, for, like, maybe ten minutes in the entire But movie. I was shocked. I had no idea. Did not remember that at all. So that was kind of cute and exciting to hear him. So he takes us into the world. Mm-hmm. We open on the town of Wall, which is very uncreative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bordered by a wall that protects all of the humans from this magical kingdom called Stormhold, which is i don't know it's just like another town and there's like a forest in between it and a wall and i guess they're like good enough (laughs) (laughs) and a very old man yeah (laughs) yeah so we we were taken to a blast from the past when a kid named dunstan confronts the wall guard side note the wall guard 
is my spirit animal. <laughs> yeah, he's so funny. <laughs> I yeah. loved him. Yeah. And anyways, he manages to cross, um, which nobody's allowed to cross the wall. Like, the wall guard is there to, like, keep people out or... I guess, to keep other people from not coming in. For both. Mm -hmm. In the movie. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dunstan finds himself in a market where he meets this beautiful slave. Her name is Una. Mm -hmm. Tells him that she's a princess and she's been kidnapped to be a slave. You know, the first time I... Because I saw the movie before I read the book. The first time she said that, I was like, fuck you, bitch. Uh, Yeah, she was real shade about it. She was like, but I'm a princess. Yeah, I was like, hmm, okay, me too. So he tries her for her, but he can't. So instead, he fucks her. Yeah, like you do. (laughs) Um, Side note about the wall and Dunstan's crossing of it. All I could think the whole time he was talking to the old man was like, double back, walk down 30 feet, and just step over that wall. It's not very (laughs) tall. You didn't have to talk to no one about it. That was something I feel like they kind of, because it is like a fairy tale feel, they were like, you know what? We're just not going to explain this. But my thought was... There's like invisible barriers or... Yeah, or like maybe it is just a wall. Like maybe if you go through this hole in the wall, you go into the magic land. But if you just go over the wall somewhere else, it's just like, oh. girl, you in Farmer Boo Boo's pasture. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. Could they don't be. explain it, but yeah. that's like, I don't know. Yeah, but but to be clear... He could have just stabbed her. To, be, to be clear, that wall is four feet high. Would have taken so. no effort. So he comes back home after his little adventure, and mm-hmm. nine months later, he gets a baby delivered to his door with some stuff, basically telling him, like, here's a baby, his name is Tristan. That's, like, pretty much the worst subscription box <laughs> I've ever heard of. <laughs> like- it comes once a year, and it ruins your life. Exactly. <laughs> No, Tristan did not ruin Dunstan's life. He was a precious little bundle. Mm -hmm. So, fast forward. In Wall, Tristan's now a young man, and he's in love with the young, beautiful Victoria basic bitch. She's very, very basic. (laughs) Such a basic bitch. She is gorgeous, though. She is. I forget who the actress is, but I know her. Is it Sienna Miller? I didn't even bother to look, but I think it might be. That name sounds familiar. Yeah. For some reason, I think it is. She's hateful, though. Ugh, she's the worst. So he courts her, and he is made a fool by her other courter. His name is Humphrey. Do you know who plays him? Um, is it my dad? It's him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he sent you no child support, Aww. baby. <laughs> it's Henry Cavill, who plays Superman in DC's latest oh, shit. versions of the movies. I don't watch Superman movies, but that's interesting, too. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. And... Uh, he did not uh, win his duel with Henry Cavill. <laughs> no, no. Henry, he's hardly the Man of Steel in this movie, oh, yeah. but he kicks his ass at first. Yeah, he looks yeah. real dumb with that mustache. He, yeah, he's a fop. And his name is Humphrey. So there's so, that. There's that. So uh, Tristan continues to try to win Victoria's affection mm-hmm. by uh, losing his job for carrying her groceries <laughs> home. <laughs> and he spends all of his money on champagne. And takes her out for, like, a romantic picnic out in a field. Which I thought was adorable and would love for a person to do that for me. But don't bother spending all your money on champagne. And also, there was no orange juice. What if she wanted a mimosa? (laughs) He's so provincial. (laughs) I loved how he put all the candles, like, in the tree branches. Oh, that was cute, yeah. If a boy ever does that for me, like, instant bee jibber. Yeah, it was sweet. So cute. You know what I... As far as the grocery scene, though... What pissed me off about that was, you know, he carried her groceries home and he should not have left his job. That is obvious. But also, there was (laughs) that She cut in line. Yeah. She is a line cutter. And I have very little patience for people that cut in line. Like, I've told people off on the bus for it That is indicative of who Victoria is. Mm -hmm. She's not a good Mm -hmm. people. No, Mm -hmm. she's selfish. Mm -hmm. So, that's happening. And then... Pan over to Stormhold. In Stormhold, the dying king holds counsel with his remaining sons, one of which who will become king. So he gathers them, and then he also has this, like, council of his dead sons, because basically his sons just take turns killing each other because the last one will be king. And I guess there was, like, 11 or 12 of them, and now there's only, like, four. I think there were seven. Oh, there were seven. Seven. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I, the key, I think the king had like 12 Oh, you're brothers. right, you're right, yeah, you're right. You're yeah. true, you're true. So I love the brothers, the brothers, the so dead brothers funny. are like m- one of my favorite things in the movie. Yeah. And in the, 
Well, we'll get to the book differences. But anyways, so I love the brothers in the movie, and they're hilarious. And I love that they're all named in the order. Yes, of me too. Primus and it, Secundus. It, it makes it so easy for them. Septimus. So, Septimus. He's the worst. The youngest is always the worst. Oh, <gasps> how dare hmm. you? I admit, I did that on purpose. All right, so Dying King convinces his, like, sons to, like, immediately kill one of the brothers. I can't remember which one. Secundus, I think. And they chunk him into, like, the dead brothers. <laughs> yeah, I don't oh, remember. And you know what's so cool about the brothers is they all, like appear and they're like dead brother council in the position they died in which is hilarious mm-hmm. like one guy's frosty yeah and if it is secundus that falls his face is also much he's like the funniest one yes because his hair is all <laughs> brushed to really the side tough. like there are emo kids right now that have that <laughs> hairstyle <laughs> oh girl throw back to high school uh, yeah very much so so the, the king has this like ruby and instead of being like whoever's left alive is king he's like whoever retrieves this ruby is king and like restores it to its color and he like removes the red from the ruby so it's just like a giant fucking diamond and he throws it into space which first of all rude well and what this old man can't even get out of bed but he can throw (laughs) right i was like damn he he is strong he mustered the last bit of his strength i guess he did he shat himself when he threw that out the window Right, so when he throws the ruby out the window <laughs> with the last bit of his soul and then he dies, the ruby knocks a star out of the sky and we see the star plummet to earth. While back in Wall, Tristan and Victoria see the same thing happen. And then Tristan fangirls over Victoria and he promises to go to the ends of the earth and bring her back a piece of that star in exchange for her hand in marriage. She agrees because she thinks he will fail. <laughs> and she, like, basically sends him along. Yeah. Right? Just to get him out of her hair, more or less. So Tristan goes home to get all his things together, and he, like, has a little father-son chat with his dad. Mm-hmm. And his dad's like, oh, I guess it's time to tell you about your mother, I guess, after 18 years. Seems like a good time. Yeah. And so they sit down and have a chat, and then uh, Tristan reads a letter from his mom, which has a Babylon candle inside of it, which is a magical candle that gives you the power to, like, basically teleport Mm -hmm. and her letter says the fastest way to travel is by candlelight think of me and only me so he could go to her and that dumb motherfucker lights that candle while he's thinking of that star Mm -hmm. so and victoria he's a horn dog is what he's an 18 year old boy girl you know it Mm -hmm. so tristan lights the candle and then he is transported to the star Mm mm-hmm and it ends up being Claire Danes. It is a lady and not just a pile of rocks, which is what he assumed it would be. And I, I think Claire Danes is beautiful and a perfect star. Like, oh, so I, shiny. Yeah, as far as, like, physically and the way she looks and the way they styled her and what she's wearing, like, On perfect. Point. Yeah. Perfect. Her acting, I think, leaves a little be desired in this movie, but... Sure. I can, I it's can. hard to be a star. Yeah. But you know, but she looked fantastic. Star. She did look fantastic. Yeah. And the star's name is Evane. Mm-hmm. And so Tristan immediately and rudely takes her as his prisoner, even though she is injured. It's kind of beyond rude. Yeah. I mean, it is it is human trafficking is what it is. <laughs> I mean, to be frank. You will but. be a gift. Exactly. So, yeah. So he takes her so that he can give her as a gift to Victoria, which... Wouldn't you just stubbornly not walk anywhere? I'd be like, no, girl, you can carry my old heavy ass because I'm a star and I must weigh a lot. Yeah, like her leg is hurt, yeah. you know? Yeah. Meanwhile, three witch sisters have also seen the star fall and want to take her as their own because they have this sort of special ability. If you eat the, the heart of the star, you have not immortality, I guess, but you gain like youth and longevity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what are their names, Mickey? Oh, I knew. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> their names are Alamia, Mormo, and Impusa. Uh, you would be Impusa. That's I don't, okay. I don't know which she's one kind she is. Of fast. She's the but youngest you would one. Be her. Um, I think that you would be Mormo. I want to she's be her. She's the one at the end that jumps off the balcony and goes, oh, and runs and then gets eaten by wolves. I'm anyway. fine with that. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Okay, so n- <laughs> neither of us get to be Michelle Pfeiffer. We've cut off our noses to spite our faces. She kind of scary. Oh, I like her, though. I would be Michelle Pfeiffer. 
So they decide that they're going to do that, right? And so only one sister can go do it because they only have just a teensy piece of Star's heart left to eat to gain, like, youth and vitality, I guess, for going on an expedition. And mm-hmm. Michelle Pfeiffer cheats mm-hmm. and gets to be the sister, and she eats her little piece of Star heart, and then she rips off her clothes so she may, like, longingly stare at her beautiful body in the mirror, which I thought was Such amazing. Such a fierce moment. Yeah. yeah. I love that face she makes. Yeah. <laughs> So she goes on her journey, right? And on her journey, uh, first of all, she steals a goat and then turns a person into a goat. So she's not a very nice person either. No, no. And immediately when she did that, her hand got all aged. Spotty. Oh, yeah. So oh. as soon as she uses too much magic, she starts reverting back to like fugly, scary Michelle Pfeiffer. Which is sad for her. Yeah. I mean, she's an evil character, but. I do understand wanting to stay young and beautiful. And oh, I, yeah. There was a part of my heart that did twinge a little every time she got a little yeah. uglier. Because I was like, she just wants to be pretty. But on the other hand, I mean, she's evil and will eat a person's mm-hmm, heart. Mm-hmm. A star's heart, no less. So, on her journey, she encounters this witch, whose name I didn't write down and can't remember. Ditchwater Sal. <gasps> Ditchwater Sal. Love Ditchwater Sal. And that's the witch that's holding Una hostage, Una mm-hmm. being Tristan's mother from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And they share a meal, and then the witch basically puts, like, an herb in her food that tricks her into telling all of her secrets, which Lamia is not happy about. Mm-mm. So for punishment, she does a spell on her that makes it so that she cannot he- hear, see, or smell the star so that she cannot steal the star for her own use mm-hmm. it's called um lamus grass oh yes that's right. which i at first i thought they were saying lambus grass yeah. and i was like oh, lord of the rings reference and then Ian mckellen sticks his head and he's like whoopsie <laughs> <laughs> i was finished <laughs> yeah but no it wasn't that so tristan takes evane along further and she's like bitch i'm tired i got to sleep and so he mm-hmm. ties her to a tree and then goes off to do like god knows what And then while she is tied to the tree, a unicorn saves her because, of course, it does. Which, it's lucky it was a unicorn because when she thought she heard something in the woods, she was like, Tristan! Is that you? Not funny! (laughs) She, like, got as loud as she could possibly get. Look, she's a star, but ain't nobody say she was bright. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Twinkling, not bright. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So, meanwhile, Lamia is FaceTiming with her sisters. Because yeah. <laughs> she doesn't know what to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she totally is. Okay, and they tell her to stay put because uh, the star is going to come to her. So, she conjures up, like, an end with her magic. Mm-hmm. And she turns the goats into people. Even though one used to be a person, she turns them to a lady. And he's like, what are these boobies? <laughs> and then the other, the goat that, like, becomes a person that's a guy, his name is Billy. He's, like, funny. my favorite person. He's so funny. <laughs> he's so I've ridiculous. I've seen him in a bunch of other stuff. Like, he, he gets a lot of work, that actor. Ugh. Which is strange amazing. for a person with that face. I loved him. Okay, so Evane on her unicorn, stumbles upon the inn, and mm-hmm. she's welcomed in by the witch, who thankfully heals her ankle and gets her all comfy and cozy, because she needs her to be happy and shining, so that when she cuts her heart out, it's at, like, it's Maximum. optimum. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, that's scary, but also it's nice for her to get a little cozy, get a little warm bath. <laughs> Do you remember, have we already gotten to the part where she says, Billy! And the goat turned man, instead of walking around the bar, jumps <laughs> on top jumps of up. it and, like, yes, over. Yes, so great. He's amazing. <laughs> and, like, his chin hair, everything about him is perfect. He's his amazing. underbite. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's cute. Okay, so then Tristan, back where he went to find Evane, and she's not at the tree anymore. So he's like, I'll just take a little nappy do. And so he just lays down. And I'm then tired. the stars start talking to him and telling him that Evane is in danger and that there's a stagecoach coming and he has to get on that stagecoach at any cost and go save her. And mm-hmm. so he gets up and then on the stagecoach is one of the brothers, Primus. Mm-hmm. And at this point, there's only two brothers left. I think it's Primus and Septimus. Mm-hmm. Tertius and the and the bishop were poisoned right. by Septimus. That's right. That happened. Yeah. So the brothers... Yeah. So he did. Mm-hmm. And so now it's just brother versus brother. Mm-hmm. And also, might I say about Septimus, is he not a Severus Snape type if you ever saw one? Oh, very much so. Yeah. yeah. He swishes around with his greasy hair. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. A hundred percent. So Primus... Primus is, seems like a nice guy, though. Yeah, he does. Kind of. Sort of. He got a little creepy here in a second, but... Yeah, in the bath. Yeah. yeah. 
So Primus comes along. He doesn't want to take Tristan, but he agrees to do so anyways. So just as the witch is getting Yvonne comfortable and she's getting ready to cut her heart out with her little obsidian knife that she brought Mm -hmm. all the ways from home, Primus shows up and starts demanding service. So she has to go downstairs and deal with that. And then Yvonne gets curious and, like, comes down. Tristan's putting the horses away or whatever. And then uh, the witch tries to get to poison just everyone and kill them and just be done with it. It doesn't work. So Primus hops in the bathtub because he's rude, like you do. Mm -hmm. And then he starts, like, hitting on Yvain, which is awkward. And then the witch is like, ugh, enough of this. And then she, like, fucking kills him, Mm -hmm. which is pretty dope. (laughs) Did you notice that his blood is, like, blue? Yes, because he's was regal, right? Oh, he's blue blood. Mm. That's what oh, I, I didn't get yeah. it. I didn't get it. That's I was what just I like, assumed. that's a weird choice. That's um, smart. I that's didn't see that. weird. Nah. And so then Tristan comes in from outside, and he's like, oh, Yvain's here. And she's like, oh, save me. Mm. And then they try to escape. It's not working out very well. Mm-mm. And then the the witch lights fire to trap them in. So there's like this weird green witchy fire that's all around. And so Tristan has to pull out the Babylon candle and use the remaining amount to get them out of there. And so he stupidly whispers to Yvonne, think of home or whatever so that they can get out. And then they both think of their home. So they just meet halfway in the middle on a fucking cloud. I love, okay. So first of all, you, you skipped over one of my favorite parts, which is in Billy tries to headbutt the unicorn. <laughs> And that poor goat just dies. <laughs> it just gets the wrong He turns, back. like, back into a goat. He's done. Like, so dead. Yeah. Um, and then <laughs> the thing that... So Tristan, when they end up on this cloud, he's like, why did you think of your home? Which is totally not her fault. Mm-hmm. It was all his fault. And do you notice that he calls her a dumb cow? <gasps> It's I don't the, remember that. It is the one. Now, it's kind of funny because who says that? But I mean, in this fairy tale world, I guess. But it's the one moment in that movie that I think... He does not, he, it's not a good moment for him. Yeah. You know, because, like, he does things like chain her to a tree and stuff like that. But. That's just rude. It's kind of like fairy tale imperative, uh-huh. right? He's like, but in that moment to call her a dumb cow, I thought that was like, I I, I would have slapped him had I been her. Girl. But she didn't. She just kind of said nothing. So they're on this cloud and then they immediately get captured in mm-hmm. like a net, which by pirates that we will talk more about later. Meanwhile, Septimus, who is everyone's favorite snake brother, mm-hmm. he just, like, kills some dudes and gets some magic dice and <laughs> <laughs> he starts figuring out, like... That's true. That's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> he starts figuring out where to go to find the star because he wants that ruby necklace or whatever. So that's why he's looking for her. So he gets to the inn and he's too late, of course, but he finds his dead brother and then he gets really excited because he's like, I'm king. But then he, like, remembers he needs that stone to become king. Mm-hmm. And then he finds out that the stone is carried by a star and that the heart of the star will make him immortal, essentially. And then he he's wants... He's so greedy. Yes, he's so greedy. And then he wants to rule forever. So now he has, like, a new plan to, like, be a murderer times a million, mm-hmm. eat a fucking heart, and become a king forever, which is terrible. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Evan and Tristan have been captured by the Sky Pirates, which their whole trade is to capture lightning mm-hmm. and sell it, which is, like, pretty baller. Mm-hmm. And they seem super fierce, but then we learn, after the captain takes them below decks, after he's been, like, mean to them and stuff, that his name is Captain Shakespeare, and he's actually, like, a super nice, soft, really feminine man. Yes. <laughs> Varqueer. And yes. he wants to just, like, help them, but he doesn't want everyone to know that he's helping them. He wants, like, them to think, you know, that he's a big, bad pirate. hmm So Shakespeare wines and dines them, and then he's like, get in, loser, we're going shopping! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he takes them to, like, his magic closet of, like, beautiful lady clothes. And all clothes. It's, like, the b- most massive closet of wonder. So big. Yeah. And he somehow... Which is good, because he lives in that closet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he does, girl. <laughs> but somehow he still has, like, some dude clothes from his youth, and he's like, I guess this is the only choice for you, Tristan. And Tristan looks good. I was just about to say, gra. He does, It like, worked out real well for him. He does, Oof. like, magic on his hair and makes it get longer, and mm. Tristan had a horrible haircut before. He did. Yeah, it was like a butt part, kind and, of. And he really turned it around, I think. I think new Tristan, he got I mean, it going on. Tristan is hot regardless. 
But once he gets into that yeah, yeah. new outfit. Very attractive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you recognize the actor who plays Tristan? I do, but I don't know where from. He is in, he's the new Daredevil for Netflix's The Daredevil oh, Show. Yes, Queen! I did not make that connection. Mm-hmm. I didn't even not even see it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, he's gotten hotter with age. Right? I think so. That's awesome. Yeah, because that's been him. like 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, he just got better and better. Mm. I agree. Okay. Blew my mind. So after they go shopping, <laughs> they port. Well, Shakespeare pretends to kill Tristan mm-hmm. and then changes his look so that he can represent him as like a different person. Mm-hmm. So they port and they try to sell lightning to Ricky Gervais, who's mm-hmm. not even playing a character, <laughs> he's no. just playing himself. Just, you know, that entire scene was improv. <gasps> no way! That, like, bargaining scene between Captain Shakespeare and... That's great. Ferdy the Fence. Yeah, Ricky, just Ricky DeRace. He's not yeah. acting, it's just him, like, talking. No, That's he's just, just being who himself. He is. Yeah. yeah, it's great. So funny. And so, while they're there, they also see the Ditwater Sal, who is the witch who kept Una hostage. And that's really neither here nor there, except that's the first time that Evane sees her and is like, ugh, this bitch is rude, she's not even acknowledging right? me. Shakespeare helps Tristan hone his swordsmanship. Mm -hmm. So they get back to the boat after they are doing their lightning dealings. And then Shakespeare commits to helping Tristan hone his swordsmanship and his other abilities. Yeah, it teaches him to dance. Yeah, which is kind of cute. And so he's doing all that before they get back to drop them off on land. So that kind of goes, that montage goes on for a hot minute. And you kind of see Tristan and Yvaine getting like closer and more in love. She shines a lot when they dance together. Mm -hmm. It's really cute. It is. And then he drops them off. He gives them a gift of lightning in a bottle, essentially. And then he whispers something into Tristan's ear, which Tristan does not tell Yvaine. And then. It was, you've got peanut butter (laughs) on your lip. Yeah, that was totally it. That was it. Okay, so then Tristan and Yvain go off on their own, and they're trying to get back to Wall so that Tristan can present Yvain to Victoria, which mm-hmm. for some reason now she's on board with. Because she loves him. Yeah, I guess, but no girl. So, yeah. and then Tristan's real, like, lackluster about it. He's like, oh, yeah, that's what we're doing. Mm. And so along their way, they meet the Ditwater Sal, and... She gets real angsty about the flower that Tristan's wearing, which was a gift from his father, which was a gift from his mother. So she makes a bargain with him because they basically need a ride to the wall. And so she wants it back in exchange for the passage. And so he gives it to her and then she rudely turns him into like a tiny squirrel pheasant. I don't mm-hmm. know. Something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's some weird rodent. And she Looks cannot like mouse, see Vane, of. which Vane has like realizes yeah. now because like very obvious Mm -hmm. and so Yvain hops in and just like watches over little squirrel Tristan and then she confesses her love to him because she assumes that like he can't understand her and then when they get to the town close to Wall but still like a mile walk or something she releases him and then he confronts Yvain about her confession and then he's like I love you too and he he tells her that thing that Shakespeare whispered in his ear was that he already found his true love and she was Mm -hmm. there and he did and they're so cute it is cute and he also did tell him about the peanut butter though (laughs) (laughs) yes of course yeah that's adorable so they go they just immediately get a room because they're like it's time to bone town right Yeah. yeah So they do that and they spend their, like, sweet little night together. And then the next morning, Tristan gets up and he leaves to go to the wall. Why? Yeah. Why does he do it the way he does? To tell Victoria, like, happy birthday. Here's a chunk of hair that I took from my girlfriend. Yeah. Okay, goodbye. (laughs) Like, he did not have to do that. But that's what he's doing. And and then the the guy who is in charge of the, whatever, the common room in the hotel. Yeah. Smoking, like, opium or something. (laughs) And he's just like, okay, well, I'll tell my girlfriend this and I'll be right back. Well, that guy fucked it all he up. He really fucked it up. Ugh. And then Evane gets super heartbroken because like, so the sad. message the guy passed along was that Tristan went to Wall because he's sorry he found his true love and exactly. he wants to be with her forever, which is a bumbling retell of what Tristan told him. Yeah. So he gets there, right? And he calls Victoria down and then Humphrey comes up and then he whoops Humphrey's ass little redemption Mm -hmm. and then victoria is like turned on and she's like all right girl and then he's like no thanks and she's like oh and then she opens a little handkerchief with evane's hair in it and she's like she opens her gift 
And then she's super bitter. She's like, who wants this all measly stardust? First of all, girl, who? Me. Anyone. It right. was beautiful, like, gold, glittery black yeah. stardust. I would take that in a second. She never heard of eyeshadow. Because <laughs> that would have been good eyeshadow. Girl. Mm-hmm. So Tristan freaks out because he realizes somehow that it means that Yvain can't cross the wall or she'll turn into stardust, right? So he books it. Mm. This was actually, this moment of him booking it back. While, like, other people are also heading towards this hole in the wall. It's really tense, actually. Like, my heart started beating fast. Right. So, simultaneously, Yvain is on her way. And then on her way out, when she was all sad and heartbroken, Tristan's mom, Una, was trying to get her attention. But probably Mm -hmm. because she wanted to let her know, like, you cannot go to there. Mm -hmm. So, she couldn't get her attention. So, she locks Detwater Sal up. And she takes their little carriage and, like, starts riding to wall, too. How did Yvain get to there before her is one question. That is a good question. Evane just, like, f- floated there magically, quickly. Yeah, you know, sometimes being sad and heartbroken makes you fast. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're both simultaneously going. Meanwhile, the witch, Lamia, Lamia, mm-hmm. is also on her way because she knows... Just call her Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle let's, Pfeiffer. I mean, let's be way. honest. That's, I mean, it's yeah. Michelle Pfeiffer. And uh, she not looking good, girl. No, she She used her too many magic, and Mm -hmm. she be FaceTiming too frequently with her (laughs) sisters. (laughs) Well, she made a whole damn in, which I feel like... uh, She could have done something smaller. I didn't see anything real obvious when she did that, but I think her vagina just withered up. (laughs) That's what that was. Like, that's a lot of magic. Mm -hmm. And then Septimus is also simultaneously on his way because Mm -hmm. he uses his magic dice to find his direction to get there as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very tense, and what happens is Ditwater Sal and Una arrive at the same time as Yvain. Una stops Yvain from going, and then Michelle Pfeiffer arrives, and Ditwater Sal is like, what star? And Michelle Pfeiffer's like, bitch, I don't have time for you. Explodes that hoe. Mm-hmm. Straight up uses magic to explode her. And so then awesome. she's basically just shredding skin at this point. Like, she is, eek. I lo- There's... I love that moment because, one, when we first met Ditchwater Sal, well, that is when Michelle Pfeiffer did, they were eating like a cat. Do you remember that shit? Yeah, heads or tails. She was like, tails. heads or tails. Yeah, right? Whatever. Gross. And that's how she, po- or not poisoned her, but dosed her with the truth serum, right? Yeah. And then Michelle Pfeiffer has that catty moment where she's like, heads or tails. And then oh, yeah. somehow Ditchwater Sal, I didn't know that that meant I'm about to kill you, but Ditchwater Sal knows. And then Ditchwater Sal like pits her magic. And every witch in the movie and in the world, like, their magic looks slightly different. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer's is like... It looks like um, Death Eater magic. It's like it green does, and like venomous. Yeah. And Ditchwater Sal's looks like dirty wood smoke. And it's really awesome. And then she blows her head right off. Scrape off, girl. Girl, that happened to me once. So then she is like, Evane, you're coming with me. Mm-hmm. No choice. And she's like, also you, Una, you'll be my slave. Which is just sad for Una. She just gets out she of one slave deal. <laughs> Right, so they leave, and then Tristan makes it to the wall too little, too late, and he's like, oh, I'm so sad. Mm -hmm. And then the wall watcher is like, fuck this. I quit. (laughs) That bitch just got her head blown (laughs) off. I'm 98 years old. He doesn't have time for it, so he Mm -hmm. leaves. And so Tristan runs into Septimus, right? And then they kind of agree, well, we're both going in the same direction, or like they go there, and then they're like, okay, well, I guess we're going to like do this together. Which is good, because Tristan could not have done this by himself. No, definitely not. Mm -mm. Okay, so when they get there, Lamia pretty much immediately kills Septimus, right? She gets a voodoo doll out. Or maybe does he kill her sister first? He does kill... Yeah, because Impusa tries to, like, burn him or whatever, and he throws her through a mirror and stabs her. Something. Yeah, he kills her. He kills her real good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then Michelle Pfeiffer gets a voodoo doll and she breaks his arms and such. And then she drops his ass in a pool of water and he drowns. Which is another really beautiful scene. Like when he's floating, you know, and then he's just dead. Nice little magic. Yeah. Okay. And so then. They all, kind of at the same time, because all the dead brothers are there, too, they all realize Una is there, and she's alive, right? Because Septimus talked to her, too. And they were all like, sister. It is one really, that's like a really sweet moment, because they all kind of hate each other. I mean, they get along fine, but, like, they literally have killed each other off. But, like, 
there's no tradition of killing the sister. So they're like all happy to see her, which mm-hmm. I think is really sweet. And it confirms that she was in fact a princess. Exactly. And it does also speak to sort of poisonous masculinity, but that's, well, yeah. that's a yeah, different yeah. topic. So they realize that and then Tristan meets her and she's like, I'm your mother, which mm. big moment. And he's like, he's in the middle of a lot of stuff. Yeah, so like, that's on. a lot to put on his yeah. shoulders, but whatever. And so then Tristan tries to save Yvain and then it's not working out very good. He's not doing a good job. And so... Well, it's hard. Lamia... Wait, what happens to the little cackly witch sister? What's her name? Oh, Morma... Um, Impuza, the little baby one. She's the one that gets stabbed. Oh, right. What happens to the other And one? then, oh, Mormo, when... When Tristan comes... After the... After Septimus is dead, then Tristan comes... Tr- something's happening. He's there in the hall with them. And then... Um, Michelle Pfeiffer's like, Mormo, go get him. And that's when Mormo runs down the balcony like a linebacker and jumps off the end. And then Tristan, instead of attacking her, opens all the animal cages. <gasps> oh, right. The ferrets jump on her. Oh, yeah. And then the wolves come. That was scary. They eat her. Yeah, because mm-hmm. they cut those animals open to, like, do yeah. fortune telling. And they may well have once been people, too, because they can <gasps> oh, yeah. change people into that's animals. That's sad. So. Yeah, so she, she had it coming. She did. Yeah. She had it coming. <laughs> right so all, all them witch sisters dead now except for michelle fiber mm-hmm. and she doesn't have time to go down there herself for a minute so oh, no, she, busy. she uses her voodoo doll and re-erects septimus for a pretty cool fight in my opinion mm-hmm. where he is dead weight but is re-erected so sexy and he is fighting Tristan, right? Mm-hmm. Did you mm-hmm. like that scene? I thought that was really cool. I love how his head's flopping around, you know? I did wonder, like, how are you making his hands keep holding on to that sword? Magic. It is magic, yeah. But I thought that was a really cool scene. And I did definitely have the moment of, like, how is Tristan going to... St- because, like, literally, if he chops off the arm then she can pick up the arm of the voodoo doll. Like, it's impossible to stop that. Mm -hmm. So that's a very powerful little witchy tool she got there. Yeah, so he... Does he kill Septimus, or does he just... He drops a... Well, he drops a bunch of chandeliers. Yeah. But finally he drops one on Septimus. Right. And then he makes his way up to where Mm -hmm. Lamia and Yvain are. Mm -hmm. And then... Lamia feigns super sadness that her sisters are dead, so and she's like, "Never mind. Who cares? Life is meaningless." <laughs> she got me, girl. She really did get mm-hmm. me. I was like, because you know the it's not in the movie; it's only in the book. But the backstory of like how they became magical is when they were all younger, like teenhood years. Um, Lamia got very very sick, and she was she's an eldest sister, and she was like on the verge of death. And then the two other sisters were like, fuck, we really love her. We want to save her. And so they tried magic. It didn't really work. And then they heard about eating a star, the heart of a star. And so they killed the star that came down. And Pusa was like, the youngest was actually the one that did it. And then they all ate the star. And that's how they fucking became witches. Like, at one point, maybe Lamia never cared. But her sisters actually did love her. Mm -hmm. Which I think is, you can see that throughout the movie even. Like, the fact that she's the only one that cheats. The other two sisters actually... So she's, like, pretty legit evil. Her sisters, you could argue, were less so. Though they did many evil things. But, yeah, she got me when she looked at yeah. her two sisters' dead bodies. Oh. Right. So Tristan and Van are like, I eat. And they go to, like, <laughs> leave. Yeah. And they get all the ways to the door. And Una gets so excited. She's like, oh, we're all going to be a happy family. No, girl. Door slam. Mm-mm. Which starts cackling. Mm-hmm. And she brings it. Pretty full force. Oh, yeah. She starts shattering windows. She be getting her black magic on. Now, that was a really fabulous scene, but I I couldn't... I'm really not this person normally who's like, why didn't they do this? But they kept running in front of more unbroken mirrors and instead back. of gone... But could, could just go backwards. <laughs> Gosh, she done broke those mirrors. <laughs> Becky, she cannot break them again. That's fine. Oh, whatever. no, girl. If only I was there, I would have told them. So, in the end, the way that they defeat Lamia is Yvain holds Tristan very closely, tells him to close his eyes, and then she shines, because that's what stars do, Mickey. Yeah. Oh my god, it's a theme. Yeah, and then she shines so hard and bright that she explodes old crackety ass. <laughs> <laughs> she is crackety ass, man. 
she also burns off, little known fact, all of Tristan's pubic hair. Oh, <laughs> well, she liked better that way that anyway. It's cleaner. Yeah. So that happens, and then her necklace explodes, and then they're leaving to go, like, hold hands with Una and be happy family. And Tristan's like, what's this diamond? And he picks it up. And then all the color is restored back to the gemstone, right? Mm-hmm. And all, everyone looks on, and then Una's like, oh, this means you're the last remaining heir, so you're going to be the king now. And he just takes it in stride. He's yeah. like, all right, Go. <laughs> you're going to be the king now. And then all the ghosts, like, disappear because mm-hmm. their purpose has been fulfilled. And Septimus, I think I'm right about this. He's the only one that goes to hell. His <gasps> turns red and goes down. Oh, the shit. Others go up. Mm-hmm. Damn, girl. I know, right? Yeah, he's a bad one. So the next kind of what happens in the end is Ian McKellen does a lot of overture talking where mm-hmm. he talks us through it's happening. Tristan and Yvain ascend the throne. Una's reunited with Dunstan because I guess he never dated no one else. He's just been waiting around. And yeah, they, he's so sad. They get together. Una gifts to them on their throne a, a Babylon candle so that they could use it to go mm-hmm. back to Which the Which threw me for a loop for a second because Babylon candle is black magic. And I was like, oh, what is Una doing making black magic? But she got it probably from Dishwater House. Oh, probably, that, yeah. That, so, anyway. So, then basically they live a long, happy life where they rule over Stormhold. Mm-hmm. And they wait many, many years until all of their children and grandchildren grown. And then they light that Babylon candle and they go to rest among the stars together forever. That's very cute. That's so sweet. It's significantly sweeter in the movie than it is in the books. Yeah. But we'll get to that in a Yes. Bit. So I had uh, just a couple stray observations. Mm-hmm. So we already said Ian McKellen was the narrator. So epic. We love the wall guard. Could have climbed over any part of that tiny ass pony fence. <laughs> Um, side note, Victoria can eat a dick, and she showed yeah. up at their coronation all huffy and puffy. Mm-hmm. Which, and why were they invited? I don't know that. Well, well, probably because Tristan wanted to show her that she made a really bad mistake. Yeah, well, she did. And I love that moment with Humphrey and Captain Shakespeare. Did you catch that? Do you remember that moment? Yes. It's yeah, a very, they have like a little mm-hmm. winky eye moment, and Victoria is affronted. Yes. Well, girl, you should have looked at that mustache. Side note, I wrote this down. Do you know what poppycock means? Pop- yeah, like poppycock is anything that comes out of your mouth. It's like foolishness. <laughs> it's like, poppycock. Foolishness. Your poppycock. Okay, you just learned that word, so I'm really proud of you. I've known the word. I just didn't really know how to use it. I'm a really. cock poppy, if you know what I mean. You got flowers on your dick? <laughs> no, it's co- like poppy, like Spanish. Oh, I see. Like poppy. Oh, poppy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, stupid. If the stars can talk to Tristan, why can't they talk to Yvain and just tell her never to go to that inn in the first place? Yeah, there are, I would say in the movie, there are two big, what's it called? Gods in the machine. Deuce ex machinas. Mm -hmm. One of them are the stars, which just talk at that one time and never again. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, maybe they used all their little star juice to do that or Mm -hmm. something. I don't Mm -hmm. know. The other is the unicorn, which in the movies, it's great that it is, it appears because Yvain really needs it, but like, it just appears and then in the movie just disappears. Mm -hmm. Like, it just is never seen. It doesn't even come to the coronation, which I know why that is and I'll tell you about that in a list in a bit. But those are both kind of like, maybe indicative of why it is like a C plus movie. (laughs) I was like, So, yeah, for sure. Another thing, at the end, when they do get to go sit among the stars together forever, them stars are very far apart. Like, thousands of light years apart. I noticed that. I was like, girl. So, essentially, they got divorced. (laughs) (laughs) Like, they do not want to spend time together. No, that's so funny. You're right. (laughs) Mega far apart. Yeah. As another side note, the, I have adopted into my personal philosophy that when you die, you get to rest among the stars forever with uh, somebody that you love. Aww. Like, that is, like, legit a part of, like, my personal philosophy now. That's adorable. I'm 100% from this, because I think it's so sweet. And I'm a big believer of, like, you just make up your own religious shit, and, like, that's what you believe in, and this is part of mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm totally, I'm with you. I would love to float in the endless vacuum of space with no sound or way to breathe. I knew you would. It's very me. It's really your it's jam. It's very me. Yeah. 
So, Morgi, thank you so much for that beautiful sort of plot rundown. You're welks. Pony wall is my favorite part. <laughs> is that like a thing? Like a pony wall? It is now. Okay, because I love that. And I'm actually, <laughs> if that's not a thing, we're going to put in that in Urban Dictionary. For sure. <laughs> Um, so some, I was thinking about sort of like main themes of Stardust, and these themes are specifically from the movie, because the book is very, very different. Like, even the first words of the movie, uh, Ian McKellen says, this is the story of how Tristan became a man by winning the heart of his one true love. In the book, it's something more like along the lines of, narrator says, this is how Tristan went on a quest to fulfill his heart's desire. Which is very different, mm-hmm. actually. Like, that's a huge, huge difference. But since this is the movie you were talking about, I so I was thinking about kind of, like, maturity. And kind of, this is Tristan's specific coming-of-age story. But I got a little bit butthurt because I was like, okay, do I have to win the heart of my one true love to become a man? Is right. that, like, what this movie is trying to tell me? Because... I'm fucked so far. <laughs> I'm still like a preteen, evidently. Um, but then I, I realized that no, this is just specifically how Tristan became a man. Right? Like, everyone's coming of age story is different. Like you did a donkey show in Tijuana. And <laughs> I didn't, but I wish I did. Right, now well, that you said no, it. No. <laughs> Girl, I I believe in you. Travel, travel, <laughs> I can still right? Do it. <laughs> um, so this that's how Tristan matures. And in order to complete his quest, there are a few things that he kind of has to learn or grow into in order to become a man for him. So the first is to sort of dream and to believe that you can achieve whatever you're dreaming. And I feel like this comes up a few times. Like, do you remember in the beginning when he's at the picnic with old what's-her-face? Victoria. Yeah. I almost said the name of a girl we went to high school with, which we would have had to edit out. But oh, since I didn't oh. say it, I can just be shady and keep it to myself. Um, he says something about, you know, wanting to marry her. And she was like, oh, a person like me would never marry a shop boy. And he was like, I'm not a shop boy. I oh, I love that. in a shop. Yeah. yeah, I love that too. I identified with that so hard. <laughs> oh, 100%, right? Like, I literally am a shop boy right now, at least part of the year. You're not a shop boy. You just work in a shop. Thank you so much, Morgie. You're welcome. And you're not really a person. <laughs> you just live in a human's body. <laughs> you're a parasite. And that's all you'll ever be. Uh, anyway. Yeah, you worked at Sonic for years. Oh, girl. In too fact, when many you were obsessed years. with this movie, you were working uh, yeah, at Sonic, didn't was. you? Now, you were in college at the time as well mm-hmm. for most of, mo- most of it, if not all. Yeah, right? all of it. All of it. Well, you didn't you do it in high school, too? Uh, like at the very end, like summer okay. job. It, yeah, it was anyway. my job for like all summers and like all of college. Anyone who has ever done a job, like the jobs that we have done, knows that like that is actually very important. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to be something more, you have to constantly remind yourself that this is just your job. This is not who you are. But what's really sad is later on, when they're on Captain Shakespeare's ship, Evane is talking about sort of dreaming about being down on Earth. And Tristan says, I admire you for dreaming because a shop boy like me couldn't even imagine these things to dream of them. Mm -hmm. And it's That's what I'm fucking talking about. You gotta dream big, boo-boo. Exactly, girl. You're very thematic Mm -hmm. today. That's exactly when, though, Evane says, you know what? People aren't what they seem. That's something I've learned. There are shop boys, and there are boys who just happen to work in a shop. Which, true enough, he had said earlier, Mm -hmm. and you just said to me, but it means a lot then, because it seems like he's backslid. Like, seeing this whole new world has made him feel small and insignificant. Yes. You know? Yeah. So I thought that was really important in his, like, quest of maturity. Yeah. Um, Something else that was uh, really important is simply being courageous. Because uh, near the end, when they're about to fight the witches, his mom says, be the man I know you are. Like, go fight these three massively more powerful than you witches. And I feel like that's kind of connected to that idea of the time of hiding is over that I was talking about in Fellowship of the Ring. There is There are these crucible moments where it's like you either stand up or your time to stand up passes. Yeah. You know? So you have to, like, seize that moment. 
Okay, so dream, believe you can get there, seize the moment when it comes. And then, this sounds so stupid maybe, but just simply like believing in yourself and being yourself and trusting that you will find people who appreciate you for what you are. Yeah. I feel like that's a big... Like, the whole time that they spend on the ship with Captain Shakespeare, that's a big theme of that time. Because Captain Shakespeare, of course, is in hiding. Um, And then Tristan has these sort of provincial expectations, which are embodied by Victoria and Humphrey. Um, But then when he gets out into this crazy magical world, he sees that everything is different. You know, and he throws him off. He doesn't know where he belongs or if people will accept him. Right. Um, and then even Yvain, you know, when she first came to Stormhold, she saw her starriness just as a vulnerability and something that people would want to literally rip out of her. But it turns out that it is, in fact, their greatest weapon. Like, she literally kills this witch mm-hmm. who Tristan's tried to kill already. But remember, that witch beat him with her little magic knives. Mm-hmm. Like, she kicked his ass, actually. So if... She hadn't been the star beyond all the other stuff that has to do with the plot. They could not have killed the witch. Yeah. Okay, so that was a big thing I noticed. And then the other big theme, besides, like, maturity and what it takes to become who you're supposed to be, is, and this is obvious, probably was the theme of love. Like, what is love and how do you find it? So the first thing is pick the right one. Which sounds really simple, but I think everyone knows it's very difficult. Tristan got it wrong the first time. Right? Who didn't? Right? (laughs) Girl. (laughs) (laughs) Been there, done that. (laughs) And then something that I thought was very, very powerful, sort of the second thing I learned from is when you find the right one, ask only for love. A heart for a heart. There can't be... Extemporaneous expectations. Yes. Yeah. If there are any ulterior motives, then it, it's a maybe a kind of love, but it's not mm-hmm. that true, true love. Right? That fairy tale love. And there's a quote that uh, Evane says I think is so beautiful. I'm, I know you'll remember it when I start to say it. It's when he's a mouse or whatever. Mm-hmm. Fairy thing. And she says, the only thing that made watching your world bearable was love. You can never find anything more beautiful. It is unconditional unpredictable, unexpected, uncontrollable, unbearable, and easy to mistake for loathing. Which I thought was so... I like that because that's not just like, love is great and wonderful. It's also like, no, love is very powerful and dangerous and Mm -hmm. actually can lead to very dark places. And it's very confusing. And when you're in love, you really have no control and it's silly to think that you do. Yeah. You know? So there's some big themes that I found. Yes. Which one of those touched you the most and will change your life the most from this moment on? I like that part where you were talking about when uh, the witch, like, uh, kicked his ass with knives because you have to be your own protection when you're a woman. Well, that's fair, actually. <laughs> okay. I, I'm glad you got that from that. Good job. No, I'm such a sappy person that, like, the love stuff, I think, is the best. Like, I... Once again, love, fantasy, adventure genre is, like, my jam. But without the love, it's just fantasy adventure, which I'm a fan of. But, like, I need a little bit of love in my life. I mean, we all do. It's an inexhaustible topic. It's crazy to think how many people, talented, brilliant people, have written about or, like, tried to explore love. And we still don't kind of maybe have a handle on it but like it's real weird it's such a weird thing what is love it's an ongoing investigation it is Um, so as far as inspirations Morgie you talked a little bit about like the process of Stardust becoming a novel Um, you know because I am a huge Neil Gaiman fan I've got this big nerdy book that only a Gaiman nerd Mm -hmm, would own mm -hmm. And it's called The Art of Neil Gaiman, The Story of a Writer with Handwritten Notes, Drawings, Manuscripts, and Personal Photos. No dick pics, though. Too bad. Yeah. I flipped through. I didn't see it. No dick pics. It's by a woman named Haley Campbell. And there is a whole chapter that's all about Stardust. Nice. Hmm. So I thought I might just quickly read you to sleep. <laughs> with some I'm ready sh- for it, baby. Yes, you're prepared? Okay. So this is how... Um, Neil Gaiman had the inspiration for the the village of Wall. Okay. He was on vacation in Ireland. 
It was on that drive through Ireland that I remember looking across a field and there was a wall halfway across the field that had a hole in it, or a gate. I think it was a gate in the middle. And I just thought, wouldn't it be interesting if the other side of that wall was fairyland? And it was as simple as that. You've got a wall, and you cross it, and now you're in fairy. And the idea just grew. On the flight over there, there had been an in-flight magazine with a photograph of a little town. And I think it may have been a town in Portugal, or in France, or Spain, or somewhere that was just basically on an outcrop of rock. And I thought... I'll borrow that town, and I'll put it somewhere in the north of England, and I'll call it Wall. I came up with a story all about this town, and I wrote the first chapter and the introductory pages about Wall as well. And that was in 1987. Damn. I know, right? Um, So I think that's funny because... I wasn't even born yet. I know, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, your mother hadn't even done the sort of demon rituals that would bring (laughs) you into this world. (laughs) Uh, I just think that's funny because it's like so often people are like, how do you get your ideas? Mm -hmm. You know? And anyone who has ideas is like, I don't, I just like, they just, I look around, you know? Or like I read a fucking in-flight magazine or Mm -hmm. like, how do you not get your ideas? Inspiration is all around you. Exactly. Okay. So that was inspiration for Wall. The inspiration um, for sort of a star-centric story and like a falling star, I think, is even more interesting. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, directly after Sandman had come out Mm -hmm. and been very famous, and he was sort of on a break. He was uh, on a smoke break, most specifically, at a party, and I think he was in New Mexico or something. And his friend, Charles Vess, who did all the illustrations for the illustrated novel. Nice. um, He's with him, right? That night, there's a party being held by Terry Windling. I don't know who that is. Mm. Do you know who that is? I'm going to pretend that's... Neil Gaiman's friend. (laughs) Yeah, Neil Gaiman's friend. Okay, fair enough. Charles stays back, but I'm at this party, and I'm outside talking to some friends of mine, and I've gone outside, probably to have a cigarette, because I smoked then. All the cool kids do. And I'm wearing a big leather jacket I'm incredibly grateful for, because it is so hot during the day, but it's so cold, desert cold at night. And we're out in this little house in the middle of the desert. And I look up and I see a falling star. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. In the UK, if you see a meteorite, it's a little pencil line of a light across the sky, just slashed across the sky with a white pencil. And this wasn't that. This was a discreet, glinting, burning, shining, white thing falling out of the sky in a slow arc in the desert where the night sky was velvet black. And I saw it and I thought, wow, that was such a cool thing to see. Wouldn't it be interesting if I could just go? I saw where that thing fell. I could get in a car. I could start walking and I'd go and I'd find it. And then I thought, and it was so bright. It was like a diamond. What if I find it? And instead of just being a lump of rock, it's a huge diamond burning bright. And then I thought, what if it was a girl? And what if someone had promised his girlfriend was trying to impress a girl by saying, I will bring you back that star, and winds up with a girl with a broken leg who doesn't want to be dragged anywhere or presented to anybody. That's a story. I like that, and it really was that quick. Damn. Right? Because he's a genius. That's why. (laughs) He's a fucking genius. I love him so much. Um, So, that's inspiration. Um, And that that happened in... 1991, for the record. Okay. So you were only, like, 26 at that time, were mm-hmm. you? Yes. You're ancient. You're old. Haggard. What What was that phrase? Old haggard bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she was. <laughs> and she I was. am. <laughs> you are not. I was. <laughs> um, so, um, Neil Gaiman began writing Stardust in 94. Um, and Charles Vest was a huge part of the story. Like, the illustrations and the words came together because Neil Gaiman had that background in comics, so mm-hmm. that was very sort of common for him. But he was working specifically on the words, and just, do you, maybe you came across it. What celebrity's house in London would you guess he wrote the bulk of this story at? It's so crazy. David Hasselhoff. <laughs> So, it, close in, like, level of weirdness, it was at the house of Tori Amos. Oh, ew. Yeah, they're, like, really good friends. Weird. I know, right? Who who would have thought? Um, and this was the only book that Neil Gaiman has published that was written completely in longhand. 
So normally oh, he works shit. on the computer. And he said that it changed the way he wrote, right? Because he was thinking about every sentence as he wrote it out. And it does read differently from Gaiman's other works. Like, if you read, like, Neverwhere or, like, American Gods, it's kind of fast and clipped and, like, hurries along. And Stardust is much more, like, flowery, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So anyway, he had just finished these ten volumes of Sandman, and they were all in gray tones. Have you read Sandman? I have dabbled in it, but definitely not read the whole thing. But I did look really hard at buying this anniversary collection, mm-hmm. but I didn't have a spare $300. I know. <laughs> it's, I haven't read it in like, it's been like six or seven years, and I want to reread it, but it's so expensive. Very expensive. It'd be a really nice gift. It would be a fantastic gift for you to buy me. No, the other way. Oh, I got confused. <laughs> Well, well, Sandman is like fairy tale esque in a way because that's mostly what Gaiman does, mm-hmm. you know, it's fairy tale esque stuff. But it's very, very complicated. There's no real good guy. There's no real bad guy. I mean, Lucifer is in some ways more sympathetic than Dream, who's the protagonist. So he wanted to write a fairy tale that was very like black and white, mm-hmm. good and bad, right? He also though was interested in writing what he called a pre fantasy fairy tale. Um, And I've got a little bit more information on that. This I know you'll like because to him, something that is pre-fantasy, quote unquote, is also pre-Tolkienian. So something before Tolkien. Uh Because Tolkien really, um, he revolutionized what fantasy was. Before Tolkien, there weren't like fantasy stories. It wasn't even a genre. It's just people wrote books. And if there was magic in it, then it was a book that had magic in it. Right. Right? So I've got this little chunk here. Um, Stardust was very consciously written, trying to put myself in a pre-Tolkienian mindset. Tolkien changed things. Before him, things weren't published, regarded, or reviewed as fantasy. They were reviewed in the New York Times by W.H. Auden. We live in a world where the idea of fantasy as being something else is prevalent, where its success means it has to be replicated to keep it commercial. Stardust was intended to be a throwback to the time where a novelist would simply write a fairy tale and nobody felt it was anything different it wasn't an aberration any more than they would look at dickens and say ah it's got a miser and three ghosts in it it must be fantasy i love that yeah that's smart and just for the record gaiman by like graphic novel and comic book people is often considered to be kind of like the tolkien of comic books like comics after gaiman are nothing like they were before that's crazy isn't that awesome Okay, so he wrote it. In 97, it was uh, published as a four-issue miniseries illustrated novel. So like a serial novel, almost, by Vertigo. And then next year, it was collected in one volume. And then in 99 was actually the first year it came out in just text only. Mm Mm-hmm. And then, as you said, no seven. Did you know that, uh, it was when the movie came out. Did you know that Gaiman was a producer on the movie? I did. It's so awesome, because normally, for most shitty adaptations is because the writer is not part of the work. Yeah, a lot of times. So he was really important in picking out the place. So you were talking about, what was the name of Isle of... Isle of Sky. Isle of Sky. I was about to say Isle of Dunharrow. Is that from Lord of the Rings? It sounds like. Yeah, it does. (laughs) Um, So he was really important. Dunraven. Dunraven. What? Is it Isle of Dunraven? Dunraven? Is Is that that where the crows come from? Sorry. In Lord of the Rings? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Where? What crows? Oh, the ones that fly over them when the yeah, I think you're right. Anyway, <laughs> so he was important to choosing the Isle of Sky, <laughs> <laughs> the Isle of Dunraven, whatever, <laughs> and um, also very important to the casting. Nice. And he also chose or like hooked up the director, who's a friend of his, with the woman who was the screenwriter. <gasps> oh. So you know, he like even though he didn't actually write it, he was actually he very, was soups involved. He was very instrumental. And of the film, he says, it's a really nice film. It's not the film I would have made, but then I didn't make it. Which I think is a very, like, it's a good way for an author to approach a movie adaptation. I feel like as a a writer, wouldn't you almost never be satisfied with someone else's interpretation of, like, your baby? No, how could you? Like, your thing? Yeah, Yeah. And, And, like, of course they changed some things, and I'm sure he wasn't happy about all that. But as a person, coming from the perspective of a reader and a watcher, mm-hmm. 
I like the changes they made. I like... Uh, well, I, I do too. I like it for a movie. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not upset that the changes were made. Because I think that made it... They were more appropriate for a movie. Do but, you want to elaborate on some of the changes? Sure. I actually have a top ten list here. Are you prepared for this? Do you want to reintroduce that you have a top ten list for different Oh, okay. My name's Mitch. <laughs> It's perfect! Uh, So I pulled together, Morgie, a short top ten list of differences between the book and the film. Okay. They're actually not in any order. All right. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, first of all, Captain Shakespeare does not... I mean, there is a captain in the book who captures lightning, but he doesn't exist in any real way. It's like literally a page in the half. The pirates are pretty non-existent. Yeah, they're like not real characters. And so therefore, that whole like queer subplot, which I don't have a problem with, is actually not in the book at all. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a bummer for me. Because I mean, you know me, I love a homosexual. Mm -hmm. So do you! (laughs) Too much sometimes. (laughs) Um, The fairy market... Which uh, is kind of like that town that's near Uh the wall. It is open and attended every nine years in the book. Damn. Yeah, so every nine years it opens up and like everyone from wall goes into this fairy town and vice versa. But in the movie, it's just a barrier. It's it's not really like a door. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of interesting. That's a huge difference. Because one of the subplots of the book is like the death of magic in our world. You know, especially when at the time it said it's like the rise of rationalism and like science and like therefore the death of magic. So third difference, Stormhold is much more magical in the book than it is Mm -hmm. in the movie. Do you remember remember some of that? Yeah. There's like, I mean, there's like a talking tree um, and like spells that are super complex. There are elves, Mm -hmm. which aren't in the movie Mm -hmm. at all. Okay. So there's some things. So, this is kind of a sad moment. Um, Yvain, in the book, can never go back to the sky. Ever. No way, no how. She also, of course, can't go into the mundane world, so she's, like, trapped in Stormhold, and she's immortal. So, essentially, Yvain fell from the sky into prison. sad. It is sad. It's a way that, like, the book is much darker than the movie. Uh, and uh, sort of continuing along that line, Tristan dies at the end yep. in the book, right? Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like he like definitively dies and then Evain just becomes queen and rules forever <laughs> in Stormhold. She will be great and powerful. Oh, people will look upon her. She yeah. is beautiful. She is beautiful. Um, so that's strange. Victoria actually is much sweeter in the books than she is in the movies. I don't remember that. The movie has tainted me. <laughs> well, she's not, I mean, she's not, uh, she still gets left. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? She's not like really a catch. But like when Tristan says that he's going to go capture a bit of the star for her, in the in the movie, she's like, yes, go do that. But she doesn't really care about him. In the book, she doesn't even think he's actually going to go. She laughs it off, you know. She says, sure, yeah, go get me a bit of that star. Mm-hmm. Like, she doesn't really believe it. And there are lots of other, like, small... Like, that whole scene in the shop, I don't believe happens in the book. So, oh, right. So she's not as bad. Anyway. Um, oh, this is huge. I don't know if you remember this. So I told you we'd talk more about the unicorn mm-hmm. girl. <laughs> In the book, that unicorn leaps up into the inn, stabs the witch through the arm or, like, the shoulder, and and then the witch takes her dagger and stabs the unicorn through the eye and kills it and later brings it back as a unicorn zombie. I do not remember that. Bro, that shit happens. Yeah, so you, I mean, it's funny because... I see why they would not show that. Especially, isn't it really like PG-13? Oh, yes. Like, the death of a unicorn is a horrible thing. That's an example of a difference. I'm actually, I'm glad they made that change, because I think that would have been too dark Mm -hmm. for the movie. But it does kind of change 
the whole story. Because if this is a story in which a unicorn can get stabbed through the eye right in front of you, then we're in a whole different kind of fairy tale. Yeah. You know what I mean? Ferdy Defense, that uh, character played by Ricky Gervais. Oh, yeah? Not in the books. Yeah, they made Just for up. the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And fabulously so. Uh, and Neil Gaiman really loved that scene, by the way. It's one of his favorite scenes. I wish. I love when they just have people play themselves. Like, why couldn't they have just called him Ricky Gervais? I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would tell. I could see that the real Ricky Gervais would also have a thriving business mm-hmm. in oh, a fairy sure. land. Yeah. Like, I'm pretty sure he does, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, the entire fight scene at the end of the movie created for the movie. Mm-hmm. Not in the books, which I did not remember until I like literally thought this person was bullshitting me online. But the witches, and this is the tenth difference, they don't die at the end of the book. They essentially just get beaten and run off. And then before Tristan and Yvain take over the kingdom, I'm on like difference 11 now, but now I'm just talking. They actually go and like explore for like decades around mm, yes. Stormhold. Yeah, right? they don't immediately which, ascend. Which is Interesting. I guess maybe Neil Gaiman was just like, he wanted to give them like a honeymoon and then also maybe wanted to leave room for more. They're following my theme of follow your dreams and travel, girl. That's true, queen. <laughs> they got things to see. She's only seen shit from above. She needs to experience And he it. hasn't seen any of this shit Right? Over here. It's all he brand new. Um, so at some point they see the witches again, but we don't even hear if they ever kill them or like what happens to them. And Yvain does not have this amazing power of like shining, shining, yeah. which you would think, I mean, it makes sense to me because like the explosive power of a sun, right? Which is, yeah. But, um, that changes her character a lot too, because she really is kind of mm, defenseless in that case. She has no defenses. So... Anyway, those are my top 10 slash 11 slash 12 differences between the book and the movie. What would you say is an appropriate age for a kid to read this book? What what age do you think? I would say 15. Really? I was going to say 13. Why do you think, why do you think older? Um, Because of the darkness. Well, it depends on the kid a bit. Yeah, but I would say the darkness. If, if. If we're talking, like, the kind of child who's very sensitive and often reads things like, say, the Chronicles of Narnia, Mm -hmm. I think this is going to be shockingly dark for them in in some parts but i'd say like maybe a certain 13 year old a certain 15 year old um i think adults can read it and really yeah enjoy i it. didn't read it till i was in college yeah me neither yeah. well till after college actually yeah so yeah and it's really short it's like a pretty fast read mm-hmm. i'd like to get the illustrated copy i'm, I'm really need to me do that to charles vest that's the name of the okay i'm gonna look into that mm-hmm. so we have pretty good feelings about Stardust. Yeah, solid four and I four, like it. Four point two five out of five. It's like if you said you didn't like it, I wouldn't be like, that's the craziest thing I'd mm. ever heard, but I would try to convince you otherwise to see why it's good. I would immediately quiz you about other Neil Gaiman stuff, and if I found out you right. didn't like Neil Gaiman, then we're fighting. That's fair. With this. People, and- if you don't like Neil Gaiman, you can just turn this off now. Yeah, <laughs> we hide you. That's not true. So let's hear just some second opinions for people who definitively oh, hated Lord. the movie. So loud. I know. Why did you hear so important with your wrestling papers? <laughs> now, I have to tell you, I'm not happy about these reviews. Oh, why not? They're. You'll just see. Uh oh, I'm scared. <clears throat> One star by Twinkle. <laughs> Twinkle should be a fan of all things stars, am I right? Yeah. (laughs) Most stupid. The stupidest movie I have ever watched, exclamation point. They just reviewed this February 5th, 2017. Oh, wow. I assure you, the movie collection, which is vast, (laughs) encompasses many other bad films Mm -hmm. that I find it hard that Twinkle has not watched. They obviously have not seen Center Stage yet, but... Oh, but I kind of liked that. I, I love it too, but it's horrible. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, but what if you followed their like Amazon profile and like they gave five stars, like Gods of Egypt, and that was like their favorite. You're keeping up with the Kardashians. Oh, yeah, God. they would. Yep. One star by Candace Lachuma. Not into witchcraft. All right, you're not into witchcraft. I, I mean. There's That's literally fair, pictures of witches and magic things on the cover. Perhaps you could have chosen better. Whatever. Yeah. 
The witches are all evil, too, BT-dubs. I mean, they're not really into witchcraft either. Yeah. Frankly, but that's fine. Whatever. One star by Disillusioned. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this was also reviewed in February 2017. <clears throat> Inappropriate. I would have given it 100% if the captain were straight. I'm sick and tired of the homosexual agenda being shoved down my throat in all the movies and all the programs that I watch. Really, Disillusioned. Every television program chronicles the homosexual agenda. Everything that you watch. Here's the thing that Disillusioned doesn't understand. We're all around you. <laughs> Is Disillusioned not the most closeted <laughs> yeah. gay person you ever read a review from in your yes. life? Yes. Disillusioned is 14 years old. He currently has a very large pimple on his forehead. He masturbates every night thinking about Andy Sanders, who's in his <laughs> PE class, and he's trying his best to push that shit down. I understand where you're coming from, Disillusioned, but... That character was made much better by being gay, first of all. I agree. And actually, actually, he's not ever specifically said to be gay. He's shown to be queer. So he might actually be like a cross-dressing straight man. He might be genderqueer. He might be a transgender person. He might just be a very feminine straight man. Disillusion does not understand the difference. Well, disillusion's looking for gay men everywhere he looks, which is indicative of where his mind's at. That review legit upset me when I read it online. Yeah, that makes me really angry. Yeah. But, eh, it comes from a sad place. I think we safely can say, a oh, fuck you, disillusioned. Oh, we can, oh, we can definitely say that. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> <clears throat> One star by Marianne Marchant. Insanity. I hate it every minute. Don't know why I watched it to the end. Writer must be nuts. Totally insane. What? I just don't agree. <laughs> Her level of insanity does not match up with mine. Insanity! It's just not insanity, <laughs> frankly. I like, I like that lady. I don't know what's going on with <laughs> you her. You like Omerian? I do, because, I mean, what's so insane about this movie? I don't get I don't it. I know, girl. She has cried. she seen some of the other shit that's in the box office right now? Girl, has she read any other thing Neil Gaiman's done? Right? Madness. One star by Denver Buyer. They just want you to know where they live. Fair enough. Jealous. I'll never get these two hours of my life back. (laughs) (laughs) I actually am super on board with that review. Because, like, he really doesn't... Denver Buyer, who I'm assuming is a man, doesn't have anything bad to say. They're just upset about their loss of time. And you know what? I've been there. I, girl, you know me. I'm sure you can think of times where I've just got up in the middle of a movie and been like, nope, leaving. Yeah, you're I pretty won't. good at that. I just won't. I'm more often that person that'll just, like, keep either reading or watching, but I'm trying to not be that person anymore. Yeah, there's so little life left. Yeah, so many better things. Especially <clears throat> in your haggard frame. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> I'm dying. Oh, don't. No, it's not true. One star by Utopia. Not recommended. Keep away from your kids. Not a family-friendly movie, as one might expect. Parentheses, keep your kids away. Primary characters practice fornication, hopping in bed together as if it were nothing. Pirate character acts as a transvestite, and apparently that was supposed to be funny somehow. Parentheses, it wasn't. Some disrespectful language. Parentheses, see example, 20 minutes and 7 seconds. Otherwise, (laughs) otherwise, good special effects. No. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And battling between good and evil with the triumph of good. It could have been a fairly nice story, parentheses, with a happy ending, but was ruined by the moral degradation and poor writing and directing. I wonder what the word is that they pulled out 20 minutes and i wonder if it's when he calls her a poppycock oh (laughs) it's poppycock it's not it should be maybe it is uh i think it's also safe to say this person is terrible Mm. and i have said this many times and i will say it many times more i am not into the way that we shield our children from the idea Mm -hmm. of sex or relationships Mm -hmm. and that is what is wrong with our culture this is why young men grow up and don't know what to do with their urges and emotions and like horrible things happen when Mm -hmm. not that it would fix every situation but just like simply just it being a thing Mm -hmm. like your fucking kid only exists because you fucked your husband Mm -hmm. what's your name fucking utopia you fucked someone and that's how you have kids to keep 
content away from and I'm not I'm not a fan of shielding like when I have friends who are like my parents wouldn't let me read Harry Potter I'm like let me stop you there fuck your parents a hundred percent you know I have, a, I have a friend in Chicago who I may have told you this story before his he was from mm, very religious one of those really intense churches Seventh Day Adventist oh church. that's a yeah maybe I could be making that they up but it was thing. one of those real intense ones he was secretly reading Harry Potter. He hid it underneath the couch cushion. It was evidently a place his mom never like sat or whatever he thought was a good hiding place. He was like, Smart she never guy. cleans here. <laughs> yeah, right. She found it and ripped every page out, and then ripped the cover in half and threw it away. Your friend's mother is a horrible person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I hate her just on principle. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm really doing the same in my life where I'm trying to feel like more positive about stuff. But mm. then I read shit like that, mm-hmm. and like, I feel like there's a reason I feel so angry about it. And mm. and I just, I, I'm just really against it. And and we we shield our youth from too much, and yep. it causes problems and and questions that they should never have to hide. Like they mm-hmm. should always feel open to ask you and to just know and like. Just understand how the fucking world works. I'm just, I'm so sick of people yeah. shielding their children and like, I just, I can't stand it. I'm a hundred, no, I'm with you because best case scenario is they're confused and make mistakes. Worst case scenario to my mind is that that hardens and they become that closed off person. Who yes. Doesn't who writes respect. that other review about the mm-hmm. homosexual agenda. Yep. Doesn't respect anyone else, you know, and just isn't aware that. There are other people on earth and those people's minds are just as good as yours and their beliefs are just as strong as yours. So listeners, if you have children, you're going to do whatever you want and everyone's got a fucking opinion and I know that's so annoying. And neither of us do have children, so granted, whatever. But I just think like maybe just consider like let your kids read whatever they want, even if there's like a mild sex scene in it. Mm-hmm. Let your quid kids question like, what's that about? And like, what's the meaning of love? Like anything mm-hmm. that gets them questioning the important things and like it, just do it. Just fucking yeah. do it. I'm going to do it when I have kids. <clears throat> Last one. One star by Matthew Abel. Blah. How did this receive so many good reviews? In the mood for yet another trite fairy tale? There is enough cringeworthy worthy contrivances stilted acting and sappy endings and stardust to last a lifetime don't believe two thumbs up and five stars this one's a stinker hmm i don't i don't entirely disagree with this person i don't think it's a stinker i don't feel hateful like i do about utopia no no there are two up there before it that really pissed me off but that one you know what he's right i do think it is a little too happy of a happy ending Seeing as how the book is, like, 180 degree difference much darker. Like, maybe if he had actually died at the end, you know? Yeah, maybe. Like may- and then maybe she could have gone back to being a star. Like, maybe that would have been just enough bittersweetness, but... Mm, I'm sorry you didn't enjoy it. What was his name? Hyper- Matthew Abel. Matthew Abel. Well, Matthew Abel, I think your name should be Matthew Kane because you are <laughs> hateful. Yeah, but we... We hear you, but really, fuck those other two people. Yeah, but fuck those people. Oh, fuck anyone who doesn't like what I like. True enough. But that's just on the <laughs> run. Facts. That's on the superficial level. On the deep, deep level, fuck those two people. All right, baby. Let me take you on a little journey. Ooh, I'm excited. To the game corner. Ooh, let me pull on my game corner stocking. I got my game gloves on. Ooh. <laughs> All right. We got several games lined up for you today. Okie dokie. Why don't we kick it off with a little Harry Potter sorting. Oh my god, I love it. I did not pre-sort anybody because I thought we could talk it out together this (gasps) time. Because actually, I was very confused about where these people belong, to be Mm, honest. Okay. Victoria. We're talking about movie characters, correct? Oh yeah, let's do movie. Okay, let's do the movie. Um, Well, she's not loyal, courageous, or smart. She's Slytherin. Gotta be. I think she would be a Slytherin, but also, not to be a cheat cop out, but like, isn't she kind of a fucking muggle? I mean, yeah, definitely. She's she, like she just on the cusp muggle. of like everything, but she's like super left out. She's so provincial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. She's totes a muggle. Dunstan, who is Tristan's dad. Oh. 
Uh, Gryffindor, I You think, think so? Yeah, yeah, he went out on a limb. He weren't scared. He was super courageous. He was trying to go out. I like that. I'm he stuck that. his D right in that lady. <laughs> well, he did. <laughs> he did not even ask for her no. sexual history. No, he, he sure was like, didn't. hit up. Yeah, yeah, I know he did not have a condom in his Very body. brave. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Tristan. Well, he's a pretty well-rounded guy. I do not think he's a Slytherin. I do not believe he's a Ravenclaw because he's he said, smart. He said bubbling candle. <laughs> <laughs> Babbling candle. <laughs> he's Whatever. silly. Yeah. Um, I would say that he's a Hufflepuff. I think I'll also Hufflepuff, for sure. Because he's so loyal to Victoria. That's why it gets him out into the world, right? Yeah. The wall guard. Beast. <laughs> um... He's definitely a professor. You know what? He should take over and be the referee of uh, <gasps> Quidditch. Yes, he would be good at that. He'd be awesome at that, right? Doing his yes, flips. I'm all on board with that. He'd take over Madam Hooch's position. Yeah, I love Madam Hooch, but, you know. She gotta die sometimes. <laughs> Everybody dies. All of us alone. Evain. Uh, I would actually probably say she's a Hufflepuff, too. I think so, too. Wouldn't you think? Yeah. Because she's so loyal. She's literally going to give her body and self to old Victoria because it will make Tristan happy because yeah. she loves him. I yeah. mean, that's powerful. Humphrey. <laughs> if he could somehow BJ his way into Hogwarts, he would be a Slytherin. Yeah, for sure. But I kind of think he's with Victoria on the outside. Yeah, he's super a muggle. Yeah. Super I mean, they're muggles. like they're like Dursleys. Oh, actually, I was thinking he's such a Dudley. Yeah. yeah just 100%. skinny version. Mm-hmm. Lamia. Mm, oh, well, that, oh, she's so evil. I want to put her at Hogwarts. But what if, like, she isn't in a house? What if she was like, uh, what if she dies and then she comes back and she's like a ghost for like one of the houses? Ooh, Slytherin. Or something, yeah. She could be like a Slytherin Slytherin. house ghost. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. 100%. And she would like never help the kids out and she would like constantly make it so they couldn't like enter the common room. Yeah. Yeah. She's Yeah. And she would crack mirrors when you looked into (gasps) them, especially if you were pretty. Oh, definitely. Yes. Sounds good. She'd be friends with like Moaning Myrtle just because like everyone hates her too. Yeah. Oh, and Moaning Myrtle would do what she says because she's so scary. Oh, she would. She She would be like Queen Bee. Her minion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love that. Shakespeare. Shakespeare in love. In love. Um, well, he's not terribly courageous. He's quite, I think he might be in Ravenclaw. He seems like a collector, like a museum collector type of person. I could see that. And then I could also see him growing up and being a professor, like a Mm -hmm. whimsical professor. Yeah. Like maybe he taught like herbology or something. Mm -hmm. Or like, like fashion. (laughs) (laughs) Magical fashion. Somebody's got... It's you know why? He, he totally... He owns the robe store. That's why he does. Oh, Madame Malkins. Yeah. He's Madame Malkins. <laughs> <laughs> he totally is. He is. Nice. I like I that. Know, that was good. <laughs> okay, Morgie. I've got a little game for you. I didn't know we were going to go to Game Corner, but happily, I always have this prepared. Did you have something else you wanted to do before we got here? Did I mess it up? No. Okay. Oh, no. I was I was bullshitting so that I can pretend I'm always prepared. Now. Okay, you're perfect. <laughs> I might leave that in. Uh, so this is a game called Who Said It? All right. Okay. So what I've done is I've collected seven quotes. Six of them are from the movie. One's from the book, though. So I'm pretty Damn. sure you're not going to get it, but you might be able to get it via context clues. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Number one, they might be the color of your hair, or they might be all your memories before you were three. Una, and I loved that. I do too. Yeah. That's very Neil Gaiman to me, that quote. I don't, I can't really describe it, but it's just, that's so weird. Yeah. Okay. Number two, I can get you one of them, actually. Very good guard dogs. They can watch the back and the front door at the same time. Ricky Gervais? Yeah. Freddy the Friends. Yes! Yeah. I was trying to make these harder. I hope I stumped you at least one. That one was a little tough. It was a little tough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have a bubbling candle. <laughs> Tristan. Yeah. Tell me. I love some of my favorite quotes. Here, Trey you. One more time? Here, Trey you. <laughs> Lamia? Good guess. 
It's Captain Shakespeare. Ah. Uh, when he holds uh, out Tristan's yeah. outfit. Then I'd like to tell you that you smell of pee and you look like the wrong end of a dog. Lamia. Good guess is Evane talking to Ditchwater Sal oh, when yeah. Ditchwater Sal doesn't know that she. Yeah. Can. Okay. <clears throat> I remember now. Pointless, really. Do the stars gaze back? Now that's a question. Ian McKellen? Yes! <laughs> I was sending to you so hard. Gandalf's staff. I just had flashes of Gandalf. <laughs> Did you? Good. I was sending that shit to you. Okay, and this is the ones from the book. Okay. So I, I don't know if it is. Um, they say it's the biggest in all the kingdom. Oh. The dying king? Really close. It's Primus. Or Primus, the yeah. first brother, when he's in the bath and uh, he's seducing. Oh, yeah. Evan. Gross. Yeah. I so gross. Yeah. Ugh. You nice. know what, Morgie? I'm so pleased. I don't think I've ever stumped you before. You're only pleased when I fail. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah that's what? That's what? Fair. what? That's fair. <laughs> well, let's see how you fare. Oh, Lord. On my little game that I like to call which one? Oh, which one? Which one? Which one? Which one? See, you're sweet, though, because there's no way for me to lose this. Okay. Huh? What? <laughs> 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 All right. This weekend you're going spelunking. That's when you go the like, cave exploring. I've been spe- okay. I've spelunked with your dad. Oh, that's offensive. <laughs> Who are you going to invite with you, Evane or the Wallkeeper? Spelunking. Well, Evane glimmers, but only when she's happy. And from what I've seen, of spelunking not a happy <laughs> experience. So. Um, I don't think she's actually going to be glowy, and she's a little bit, she's got a bit of a two. I'm going to take the wall keeper. All right. He's, he's athletic. Yeah, he is. And Very small. spry. Yeah. You get in those little tight spaces. Yeah. You're going to a fancy brunch, and you really want to bring it. Who are you going to bring along to make you seem fabulous? Victoria or Shakespeare? Shakespeare. <laughs> I mean, because Victoria looks beautiful, but Shakespeare knows how to dance and shit. That's true, girl. Yeah. You are itching to challenge someone to a duel, but who to choose? Mm. Septimus or Humphrey? I will tell you the truth. I'm a bit of a coward. I think Septimus might kill me, but Humphrey, <laughs> I know I could take. And he'd probably be so turned on we could have sex after. That's true. Yeah. So I, Humphrey. I, so Humphrey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. You've been reading a lot of true crime novels and have an itching to murder. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Who, who's it going to be? Ricky Gervais or Victoria? Which one? Which one? Which one? Well, I don't really want to kill anybody, but let me put myself in that mindset. Oh, it's easy. Never mind. Ricky Gervais. <laughs> Ricky Gervais. Because um, Victoria is young. So she still has a chance to grow up and be like, God, I was a stupid cunt when I was younger. True. Ricky Gervais is grown as hell. Set in his ways. Mm-hmm. And that could steal all that cool stuff in his shop. Yeah, that's true. You're setting up shop at a downtown eatery. You're going to sit there, judge all the tourists walking around, and get mm. hella drunk. Mm. Who are you going to invite to spend the day with you? The cackly witch sister or Ricky Gervais? Which one? Oh, you're out of town? <laughs> yeah, I'm busy, girl. Aww. You know I'd be there. You hateful. I'll do Impusa. 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 Yeah. She's cackly. Because, oh, like, she would laugh really hard at every funny thing you said. Yeah. yeah. I think I would be, like, good friends with her. <laughs> yeah. Her two sisters, I don't know, but the young sister, fuck yeah. Yeah, I like her, too. We'll get along. You've been given the chance to live immortally, but must transfigure yourself. Would you rather become a star or a boulder secluded in Bali, where everything is beautiful and peaceful, and somehow no tourists visit there. Which you one? You really want to go to Bali, don't you? <laughs> I want to know where you want to go. Um, I would definitely choose to be a star. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I mean, I have no idea what it is like to be a star, but I imagine there's some sense of freedom. It's a whole sky. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I would not want to be a boulder, because... Ew. Yeah. <laughs> Even in Bali. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. You're going to college, and you have to choose a new roommate. The two choices your college sent you were Lamia or the Ditwater Sal. 
Which one? Which one? Which one? It's actually quite difficult because, freakishly enough, I kind of would like them both as roommates. <laughs> Um, well, because I'm not a star, right? They're not going to... Well, they That's could... True. I, they're college age too, though, right? So they're not super magical yet. It's mostly personality-based. Yeah, I guess so. They I, could be non-traditional students. Oh, that's fair. That's, but whatever. Right. Whatever you You're think. right. I forgot about this. <laughs> that's so hateful of me. Uh, you know what? I think um, I'm going to go for Ditchwater Cell because... I like she's she's kind of like the John Waters version of okay. a fairy tale witch, All and right. like I'm down for those people. And also because I feel like Ditchwater Salas had a really hard life, and maybe if she had a good friend when she was in college, she wouldn't be such a heinous bitch today. That's true, baby. You help yeah, her out. I'm gonna try. You give her a better nickname too. I will, and I'll let her know where the nearest dance office is. <laughs> 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 Kindly. It's your birthday. <gasps> You're opening a present from your boyfriend. Ooh. Which gift would you rather receive? A hanky full of glittering stardust or a lock of hair from the woman he actually loves? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Um, I would prefer to have the lock of hair because with a lock of hair, I can do black magic. Oh, girl. Mm-hmm. That's and if that motherfucker thinks... <laughs> He's gonna break up with me on my birthday and bring me a fucking lock of hair. I'll tell you what, that bitch is no longer for this world. That's what I'm gonna tell You're you. You're gonna right kill now. that fool. I'm gonna kill. He should have been a choice mm-hmm. in that murder question. Well, <laughs> I should have. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> I like that. <laughs> Would you like to be a rock in Bali where no one ever goes and where no tourists miraculously ever come? <laughs> reading and vaguely <laughs> listening to what you were saying. It was great. Well, pretty much All right. Time I talk. Let's play a little game that you created. Oh! Yeah. Created by Meg Parker? Yes! What's it called? Is it a game? Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. a game. Is it a game or a gay man? Two gaymans and a gay man. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I was really proud of this. I was really proud of this. So essentially two truths and a lie. But two gaymans or a gay man. Sure. Okay. Do you want to go first? Sure. Okay. I uh, themed my gayman uh, trivia on pirates Ooh. because we had some lovely pirates okay. in Stardust. Absolutely. Okay. Two gaymen and one gay man. <laughs> <laughs> All pirates lived by a singular pirate code. Okay. Okay. Sounds unlikely, but continue. The skull and crossbones flag is called a Jolly Roger. The one that all the pirates fly. I think that might be true. <clears throat> Blackbeard's real name was Edward Teach. Blackbeard was horrifying. Um, Which one? Which one? Two That's a gay man and a gay man. <laughs> um, I think that the gay man is... The first. Yes. All Aha! pirates lived by individual codes as mm. told by their captains because they make the rules. Yeah. Yeah. So each is like a to, like a floating city state. Yep. Almost. To each their own rules. Mm. Mm. And it is called the Jolly Roger. That flag. It is. Oh. And Blackbeard's real name was Edward Teach. You know what? I read this thing once. This is really dark. But Blackbeard, was he would capture people and they would cut holes in their abdomens <gasps> and fuck the hole. No. Mm-hmm. That's terrifying. Isn't that horrible? That's why I say he's a bad person. I like that. No. I can't get those two hours of my life back. <laughs> <laughs> Wife here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, mine are, are Neil Gaiman themed, okay? All right. So, two Gaimans and one gay man. First option. Gaiman's parents read him The Hobbit multiple times as a child. Option number two. A floating or fairy market features prominently in a few other Gaiman novels and works. So they have a fairy market. Mm-hmm. Three. The copper beech tree in the novel is a direct novelization of Tori Amos. <gasps> that one's r- not true. That's a gay man. <laughs> <laughs> I 
It's actually true. Damn! She said, you can write this in my house, like we're friends, but the only thing is, promise me you'll make me into a tree. And so you made her into this talking beech tree. Damn. Do you have a guess for the other two? Which one isn't? Oh. Which is the gay man? The second one. Wrong! His parents did not read him The Hobbit? No, but I picked that because I thought it seemed so likely. No, he... Actually, the first thing about Tolkien or, like, Tolkien-inspired they read was the Tolkien Reader, Ooh. which is so dry. Yeah, he read that at um, age seven, and then he read The Hobbit at age nine. Damn. I know. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. A talking beech tree! Girl, who knew? Not me. Right? Well, you know now. All right, Mickey. I got one last game for you. Uh oh. It's a true or false quiz. Oh, and this is going to be hard. You're mad at me for stumping you so many times. I can see the fire in your eyes. Well, it's true or false, so 50 50 chance again. Okay, all right. That's fair. But this is all about the stars. Ooh. And I'm not talking about Robert De Niro. Oh, who girl. Are you, are you talking about my little sister, Star? Oh, Starry. Starry Girl. Come on the podcast. Shout out, Starry Girl. <laughs> all right. No, I'm talking about like legit straight up stars. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> true or false our sun is a dwarf star false it's true <gasps> shut your mouth yes girl it's just that. a little baby so the the new star that they found with the seven planets around it is like our star yes oh because when they say it was a dwarf star i thought that it was different okay interesting yeah stars don't actually twinkle well true it, it is It just true. looks like, it looks like it's twinkling. It's dust. just an effect from our atmosphere. That's right. Our sun has about one million years left before it becomes a red giant and consumes us. False. I think it is way longer. Like yes, eight billion false. years? Seven billion. Nice. You know I, I'm real scared of that. So yeah. <laughs> that's the number that I memorized. We'll be long super dead. Mm-hmm. Most stars are by themselves in space, not sharing gravity with other stars or their surroundings. True. It's false. Oh. Almost all stars come in pairs, and they're called binary stars. Holy shitter. Does our star have a pair? Our sun? Our, yeah. Oh, I don't know. That's a great question that uh, I didn't answer. Maybe Thanks for me. You look like a dummy. I'm <laughs> <laughs> what if I just started twinkling, and then you realized I was <gasps> the star? Oh, uh, like Twilight? You get, like, shiny diamonds? A little bit, except I burn bright your like a diamond. <laughs> okay. It would take us 4.2 light years to get to our sun. This equals 1,000 years via our fastest forms of travel. 4.2 light years equals 1,000 regular years. Jeez Louise. Um, I think that is false. It is false. 4.2 light years equals 70,000 years. That's how long it would take us to get to our sun. Jesus. Yeah, girl. It is not happening, girl. We are no. not seeing no dwarf stars. We ain't no. seeing no other planets. That is so sad. A neutron star, which is one quadrillion times denser than a regular star, is very small. You could fit approximately one billion Earths inside of it. True. It is true. Isn't that bonkers? It's very small. One billion of our Earths would fit inside of it. Jesus. Neutron star? Mm Mm-hmm. It's too big. In our galaxy alone, there are 200 to 400 billion stars the milky way i think true it is true that's so horrifying i mean billion yeah it's horrifying and that's just our tiny little bloop yes queen oh my god there are at least 100 billion galaxies in our known universe at least true it's true that's horrifying i'm freaking out we're just like one we're just we're just a tiny speck full of bitches and we're floating (laughs) through space and that's all we're ever gonna be true Tiny speck bitches. That's all we're ever gonna you be. You all speck bitch motherfucker. Isn't that fucking crazy? It is. It's kind of. Um, I have to tell. Or do you have more? I'm sorry. No, that's oh. it. I when I was a kid, I never wanted to go to space. I've never been like I was never the like astronaut child because I've always been afraid of space and like the immensity of. Space. I think it's beautiful and fascinating, but I'm afraid. I think I'd rather be an astronomer than an astronaut mm, because like that. these astronauts essentially spend their whole lives to do like one or two space missions mm-hmm. and like that's cool it's so cool to be a person who's been in space like i'm not diminishing that at all mm-hmm. but an astronomer they spend every single day finding new planets and stars and like galaxies and like discovering new solar systems and like mm-hmm. doing math that makes a 
fucking change in our world and like it's crazy and you could totally instead of like being very uncomfortable and peeing into a tube you could drink tea and be an astronomer and that sounds lovely yeah you could get a you could get cunnilingus (laughs) while you're working while you're working (laughs) yeah little telescope yeah it's hard to have sex in space all right well do you have any other stray observations any other follow-up no game and things the reason it's hard to have sex in space is because all the bits float Well, be sure to tune in to next week's podcast where we finish our collection of Lord of the Rings talk with the return of the king. So excited for this talk. I have a feeling it's going to be really good. It's going to be great. (laughs) And we will follow the Lord of the Rings talk up probably in the kind of distant future for you guys, but with Hobbit talk, Mm. uh, we don't want to saturate you too hard, but we'll get there. So no worries. Absolutely. And we're probably going to do like maybe some Silmarillion or Unfinished Tales talk too, maybe. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. About that crazy shit. All in good time, my precious. Mm -hmm. Ooh. All right. So if you guys want to comment about anything, you know where you can follow us. We're at BNB cast on Instagram and Twitter. Find us on Facebook and like our page, Beauty and the Bitch. It's under the podcast section. Should mm-hmm. be able to find us. You can send us an email if you just want to chat about some stuff or have some suggestions or corrections. Mm-hmm. You can hit us at Beauty and the Bee podcast at gmail.com. We are on your podcast app on your phony phone, and we are in Stitcher as well. Mm-hmm. Easy to find mm-hmm. us there. And if you want to talk to me on Facebook, you can add me at M I C Mick. Parker, P A R K E R. And you can follow me personally on Instagram at Morgandolf. And if you guys have trouble finding our episodes on your podcast apps uh, for whatever reason, please let us know so we can help you. Or you can find the episodes on our website, which is where our blog lives, bnbcast.wordpress.com. So follow us by whatever means you would like to do. Please. Even in real life. Yeah, yeah stalk follow us. us around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, subscribe to the podcast if you can and rate us while you're in there. Just shoot a little five star out if you can. It matters. It totally matters. But thank you to everyone who has been following along. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it makes us feel really loved. And um, it's nice to know that we are, yes, bitchy, but also that you enjoy listening to our bitchiness. Yeah. Because sometimes Morgan's just talking and talking, not on the podcast, just in life. And I'm like, <laughs> who would want to listen to this scabby bitch talk? It's so weird because I feel same. Aww, <laughs> friends! Friends forever. <laughs> so, Morgie, before we let everyone go, what you want to plug this week, my queen? I just wanted to put a little bug in your ears. If you liked this version of Stardust, I had a couple other ones you could check out. You guys should really listen to David Bowie slash Ziggy Stardust if you have not done that before. I'm going to recommend an album, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. If you have always thought, David Bowie's cool, I guess, but I don't really know what to do, do that. Start there. Yeah. And my other Stardust plug, if you guys have not seen Because You Live Under a Rock or You're Mick and You Hate Me, have not seen Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, please check that out. Uh, The main character, her father's nickname for her is... Stardust. Oh, no one cares about that. I do. Okay. Everyone cares. They make billions of dollars. Billions I know. with I a know. B. I know. I know. You're right. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Go, please, please go listen to David Bowie and watch Morgan's silly little space opera. <laughs> Speaking of space operas, uh, <laughs> they're both space operas. Oh, they yeah, totally that's are. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Did you do that on purpose? No, but they are. Oh, my God. Um, well, um, instead of going in the Stardust realm, I am surprised to no one probably going into the Neil Gaiman realm mm-hmm. to recommend something new. My very favorite Neil Gaiman novel is called Neverwhere. It's one of his earliest, and it is about uh, a very ordinary man named Richard Mayhew, who uh, one day is hurrying with his sort of awful fiance to a business engagement and sees this poor girl bleeding out on the sidewalk in front of him. He chooses to help her and because of that he gets sucked into this magical urban fantasy, very dark underworld in the sewers and beneath the streets and on the rooftops of London. If you like urban fantasy, it is one of the best. And there was also a horribly wonderful BBC made-for-TV adaptation. I didn't know that. It actually came first. 
believe it or not, that the TV adaptation came first, and then he didn't really like what they did with his script, so he wrote the book. But I, uh. the book just feels more real to me. So anyway, check out one or both of those. Check out David Bowie. Check out Star Wars if you have to. All right. Till next time, babies. Bye, bye, baby. Bye, bye.